this is I call I like to call to order the October 18th student achievement meeting. Um, could we have a roll call, please? Mr. McBride. Yes. Mr. Riddle. Present. Ms. Hanna. Yes. Ms. Callahan Wozniak. Here. Ms. Leguizamo. Present. Ms. Gonzalez. Here. President Ewing. Okay. Um, we do have a right. we do have a, a quorum. Um, let's start with the uh, approval of the minutes of the September 20th, 2022 meeting of the student achievement. I make a motion that we approve the minutes as presented. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a uh, second to approve the minutes as presented. Mm -hmm. um, any discussion on that? Roll call, please. Mr. Riddle. Yes. Ms. Callahan Wozniak? Yes. Ms. Leguizamo? Yes. Ms. Hanna? Yes. Ms. Gonzalez? Yes. Okay. Mr. Ewing? And uh, Mr. McBride? Yes. Okay, minutes are approved. Um, let's go to um, agenda item. We've done one, two, uh, three. Let's go to item four. Dis it's discussion items for possible board action. I don't see anything under that. So, Dr. Cesar, you want to take us? Uh, sure. Um, item five, information for possible board action. Sure, there are several items for information. Good evening, um, Vice President and uh, board members, community members, guests, colleagues. Thank you for being here. Our, we have several information items on the agenda tonight. Our first item A is for um, a McCall uh, teacher to attend a virtual conference for Orton Gillingham training. This is related to, to reading instruction. Um, and this is, uh, there are se several teachers have attended, so this is just a, another professional development opportunity for one of the teachers. Okay. Okay. Any discussion on that item? Okay. Okay. Um, next is um, item B. It was renewal of Tyler Technology iVision software. And um, this is to use to track our um, employees' positions and pay their education um, and certification. So there, we also use it for um, financial reporting, budgeting, purchasing. So this is just a renewal. Okay, do I hear any discussion on that? Is that an annual cost? I believe it is an annual cost. Okay, it's 133,569. And it has been doing what, uh, what, what the purpose of it is it's effective. We, yes, so we've been using it as it's you know, it, with its intent, with, with why, how it's been designed, yes. Um, Dr. Cuevas, we haven't had any issues with implementation and or we, we've been able to implement and use it without any issues. For a few years. For a few years now. For a few years, okay. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, let's move to item 5C. Okay, uh, this is another renewal uh, regarding Thermoflow HVAC contractual obligation. Uh, this also comes to us from our um, IT department, and this is also a yearly renewal. Okay. And this is, uh, these are two contracts for a preventative maintenance uh, and service of emergency generators and the uh, server room air conditioners. We, we need to make sure that those are maintained uh, so that it's dry and that it, it doesn't get too hot, it doesn't get too cold. Um, so there are two contracts, one contract for $16,045. Um, and uh, another for uh, $9,656 for a total of $25,701. And all of the, these, um, these, uh, the generators, the generator, the, a, the HVAC, uh, they're for Brookside, Glen Floor Armory, so there, there are two, because one of the things that um, Dr. Cuevas and his department set up were servers so that if one, one failed or if there was a catastrophe, that we could continue with our internet and all our records and everything else. And if you <coughs> were to go to Brookside, just to give you a, an idea of how large these generators are, mm -hmm. they are like semi-trailer tractor size if mm -hmm. not larger. Mm -hmm. So you see Generac, Generac's a very popular brand. Mm -hmm. Usually they're, they're the size of like a, a nice chest or maybe a little bit larger to uh, help a, a home with, with uh, generate power. 
these are much larger and they require that's why the, the cost is so much more um, and they last, it, they, they, the life of them well are, this is this is this is to help prolong the life with the yearly with the service the, the service contracts so I, I can't speak to the the life uh, expectancy of them but I, I would say that the purpose behind this is to ensure that they that they do last uh, into the future in, in terms of having regular maintenance and service. Okay, right. Dr. Cuevas can. What's the, what's the lifespan on those? The one that we have here in Lincoln Center is going to be in service for over 10 years. Okay, so it's, it's, we've been using it for 10 years. I don't know what the life expectancy is, but we can follow up if, if, if need be regular, on that. Maintenance? Yeah, why don't you come up? Uh, with regular maintenance, uh, these generators, you know, they can last, you know, many years. Uh, that's why we do this preventing uh, maintenance uh, in the system. They're mechanical devices, and basically they require oil change, filters, spark plugs, and we need to hire a company to work in this specialized equipment. It's not a regular small generator. These generators, basically, they're like five, four tons. That yeah, they're, they're, huge. they're huge. Right. And hopefully you don't need them, but if you ever need them and they're not functioning, you're in big trouble. Correct. Right. Right. <laughs> Thanks. Power goes hey, out. You want to just? Well, <laughs> yeah. You, I think you, you have a lot of items tonight. So. Okay. Let's move on to item 5D. Okay. This is a renewal of securely uh, student internet content filtering system, um, and essentially that that's what it does. It, it and we ensure that it, it filters what what students are are able to access while they're here to keep them safe and to. Um, make sure that they're staying focused on what they're supposed to stay focused on during the school day. Um, so it, it complies with the CIPA federal law and E-rate requirements for student internet safety. And it, again, it's for all of our one-to-one -one Chromebook, um, our student Chromebooks. And this is also a yearly obligation, correct? It's a yearly obligation. Mm -hmm. So and a pretty important uh, device that we Most need definitely. Yes. I have a question. Uh, how effective is this particular device that you're talking about? The reason I said that, asking the question, because kids are pretty tech savvy. For sure. Mm -hmm. And they know how to get around roadblocks when they need mm -hmm. to. And I'm saying I've seen that in some of my elementary schools where sure. some parents had to come and question some of our staff about sure. how, what are my kids looking at. And so mm -hmm. apparently other kids have you know, been over to other kids' shoulders yeah. watching mm -hmm. things that they shouldn't be watching. So mm -hmm. how, how, how effective is it? So I'm, I'm going to let uh, Dr. Cuevas weigh in, bless you. But you know, just to make sure, I want to be very clear. It's it's not necessarily a device; it's a filtering system. So it's something that is constantly updating, so that students, even though um, they're very savvy, they they it's it's changing all the time to adapt to whatever might be attacking it to get through. But here's the technical expert here; he can explain <laughs> it much better than I can. But that's it in a very small nutshell. Thank you. Uh, this system is very uh, effective when the students are not connected to our network. When the students are connected to our network, we're using our internal firewall to protect the students. When the students leave our buildings and now they go to a different place, uh, with grandma, uncle, they go to McDonald's or they go to any public Wi-Fi, that's when this system comes in place that is going to mimic the same configuration that we have in our schools, but mm -hmm. outside of our network. Mm -hmm. It's basically to protect the students 24-7. Great. Wow. So, Dr. Cuevas, just for simplicity, this is, the, this is the system that if you're going on an inappropriate site or something that you shouldn't be on, like social media on the laptops, it blocks the site. From That's the correct. Student. That's okay. correct. Mm -hmm. And this is different than Gaggle because Gaggle's, Gaggle's what does the... That's good. Gaggle basically, uh, you have a human being that is looking 24-7 for photos, for videos, uh, for t uh, documents that are stored in the student's email account or physically on the student's device. So it's a combination of tools that we use to protect our students' uh, safety. It's not just one tool. It's a combination. And, <coughs> and it also applies for the staff, that That's one, right? That's what I was going to ask. That's correct. Okay. So basically, uh, it's a tool that we use for students and for staff, yes. Thank you, Dr. Cuevas. Thanks. Okay, let's move on to item 5E. 
Okay, these are uh, for, uh, this is, comes to us from the Bilingual and Multicultural Department, uh, and this is to uh, pro provide extra tax resources for the, the curriculum mapping and the work that we're doing to support our, uh, our curriculum. Which curriculum? So it would be, uh, it would be social science, science, uh, and <coughs> English language arts. L Lisa, are there math Maybe. materials in there too? It's just, it's just those three, right? No reading. Y yes, e uh, English language arts, reading, reading, social studies, science. There, there are reading materials that are differentiated, a variety of uh, culturally. They're culturally relevant. Are yes. You are you putting in more, um, more uh, phonics into the well, curriculum? We have. We spoke to this before uh, regarding the tutor mate at the at the primary kindergarten first and second where we where we're teaching the phonics and also we have CKLA that we're also utilizing and that the C that's not this though I, I want to be very clear these are these are text resources so these are these are are they're novels they're nonfiction books they're they're there are other uh, materials For third grade? no what kindergarten, uh, kindergarten through fifth, fifth. Kindergarten. do you want to you want to come up and sure I'll, I'll have Ms. Ambrosio come and because add a little you know, bit. My concern is I do, but we're, we're getting the lower grades, but we cannot <coughs> forget that we have those Shocking grades. That we do, and that's true, and I just want to emphasize, too, that we also need to create print-rich environments as well. So we need to focus on, on developing the reading skills, but we also need to provide them with an, a, a wide array of things that they're reading as well. And I think that this, that's what this does. But I'll let uh, Ms. Ambrosio speak to that, and, and Ms. Rice to as well. Certainly. So um, in response to the phonics question that you have, we have purchased CKLA for all of our monolingual classrooms and benchmark education for all of our bilingual classrooms. And That's already part of our curriculum. What grade level? K or K, K2. K2. Yeah. Kindergarten through second. And, and they're doing very good. And my concern will continue regarding our um, higher grades. And where they're going, they're, they need that support for reading as well. Mm -hmm. And, y you know, so I appreciate that, um, y you know, but you guys cannot forget about those no. students that are in the upper grade absolutely yeah. can and we address some of those um, concerns during their um, wind time as well so during the the day when st if students are having issues with decoding for instance or with syllabication of phonics or something they work with them during every day there's a 30 minute block mm -hmm. for students to work extra if they have concerns with phonics thank you in every grade level thank you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right Okay, no more questions. Let's Quick move. Quick question. On. Oh, you got a question. Go ahead. Please. Um, says unit four. Unit four out of. So the curriculum maps that we created, I'm not sure if you recall, but I've come to the board a couple of times to request materials for our curriculum mapping work that we've been doing. So up to this point, we've had up to unit three com um, completed. We just completed unit four. And so these are the materials for our quarter four for the school year, for all of K-5. These are supplemental. They supplement our ReadyGen curriculum. And how many more units um, does the team need to? This so this is this would be the. This okay. is it. Now we're working on sixth grade, mm -hmm. um, as we roll up the curriculum mapping work. And so, by the spring of this year, we're hoping that we will be coming again for materials for our sixth grade classes, if we need any to supplement the current curriculum. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's thank go you. on to. Thank you. Um, five F. Okay, uh, this is for the purchase of Incident IQ Help Desk and Technology Inventory Management Software. Um, and, and this is, again, just to help with the Help Desk and make sure that we can service and repair uh, internally our, um, so some of our one-on-one or, or one -on -one devices. Do you wanna add anything? Yeah. where this, the teachers submit technical support requests when they have a problem in the classroom, they need the projector to be fixed, or if there's a problem with the sound system, they submit a help desk ticket and the technician that is assigned to the building will receive that information and will schedule uh, a time to go and, uh, con and conduct the repairs. 
So this is in an operations? No, this is not a school dude. This is the information technology help desk stickering system. And also this is the system that we use to manage the inventory for all the Chromebooks as well, to know where these Chromebooks are. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. from the audience. Yes, go ahead, Ms. Bukovic. Is it still true that they can only access help desk when they're in the building? With the old system, yes. That was a, a problem that we have with the new help desk system. We're planning to expand that, that basically now with mobile devices, uh, application that can be installed in the in the in the actual uh, laptop. So basically, it's a, it's a later technology versus the one that we're using that is outdated. So right now, teachers can't put help desk. If you're out, if you're outside of the network, uh, basically you will need to have VPN connection to enter. But when you are in the building, you will be able to submit a help desk ticket. But if you're from outside of the network, uh, it's going to be impossible. So the teachers at home. They will need to wait until when they come with the with the existing system. That's, be That's correct. With that? Yes. But, okay. Mm. So this is the expansion to allow that. It's an up. It's, it's a latest system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. The one that we have today, basically, you know, is, is pretty much outdated, and that's why you know we need to have a better service in place. Okay. Right. Now I see that you're using um, the um, IT local funds. Correct. For this. Um, and um, that's in your budget? That's correct, in the ITS local budget. Your budget. Correct. Okay. Okay, hey, Ms. Anna? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, let's move on to 5G, please. Okay, um, I am going to ask um, Dr. Krell to come up and just speak very briefly um, about the Blue Ribbon Cohort Training and Conference presentation. The, I'm just going to ask that because uh, it's, a, it's a great honor that we have a Blue Ribbon School in our district, and I want to honor her presence here tonight and give her an opportunity to speak very briefly. And also to thank her for the work that she's doing to help to facilitate this. So um, thank you for, for doing that work and thank you for being here. No thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this is um, a conference that we were able to go to. McCall went last year um, and we learned a lot about things that schools all across the country are doing. The Blue Ribbon Schools of Excellence is separate from the National Department Blue Ribbon, um, and it actually is an assessment process and a self-improvement process <coughs> for schools that can go um, to participate. They can learn from schools. We're really excited. Myself and our instructional coach are planning to present at the conference in Florida um, around MTSS practices and how we can help grow all kids equitably. And there's a couple other schools, um, Greenwood, we're really excited, is interested in this process, and so is Little Fort. All um, right. And so some of their teams are looking at coming as well to start the process and begin that self-improvement. I have no doubt that the amazing things they're doing could be taken to that conference next year and presented to schools across the nation. Mm -hmm. And I am wow. so proud because I have my children, my grandchildren are products of McCall yeah. at Blue Ribbon School. And um, I'm glad that you all are going to take your uh, skills, experience, mm -hmm. and your successes mm -hmm. um, to this conference and <coughs> show just what just you what Waukegan's all can do. doing, right? There's mm -hmm. great things happening all, all across do, Waukegan. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Also, again, congratulations to Principal Iris and, and Grossman for engaging in this process as well. Want to make sure we acknowledge them as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, our next item is uh, attendance at the NABSI conference for one of our principals. Question. Yes. Um, so for this one, uh, Washington Elementary is not listed as uh, the targeted student group for um, the last few years, right? I was just taking a look at the last few years. I don't know what the new year looks like. Um, but and so I was wondering why haven't we targeted all of the ones that have um, the student group of black students um, struggling um, attending to attend the, the yeah. NAMSI conference that's something um, I, I can discuss with the area superintendents and get back to you on that yep that sounds amazing sure. I yep. appreciate no, that. no problem mm -hmm. great question okay thank you 
Okay, item 5i. Uh, this is uh, another really great opportunity that uh, I think we're lucky to be a part of our, our Japanese lesson study. Um, and um, I, I think, Matt, if you want to come up, I just I think it's a really great opportunity, some great work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So just want to acknowledge that work too. All right. And um, just, I'm just going to give him a couple minutes to explain this. I think it's better to hear it from, from Matt. I think you know how excited he gets about this. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from him too. No, no, please don't. <laughs> we, we love the enthusiasm. Uh, hello, board members, vice president, uh, members of the audience. So lesson study is a, a type of um, learning that teachers do that they do in Japan. Japan is the number one uh, free world uh, educational system. And uh, lesson study was uh, actually developed here in the United States. Back in um, the combination of lesson study and math was developed uh, by the Japanese and by the Americans right after the war. And we Americans said, this is how you teach math. And they said, okay, and they did it. And they just passed up the United States because they did what we said we, we're not doing. It's actually kind of funny. So, um, but to make a long story short, uh, Dr. Takahashi uh, came to the country in 1990, came to the United States to see a lesson study teaching through problem solving in action. And what happened was he saw that we weren't doing what we told them to do. And the United States said, hey, can you stay around and work with us? He has 10 cohorts around the world, um, every, everywhere from, uh, from Ireland uh, to Germany to San Francisco to Chicago, and he has one in Waukegan. Um, it was, uh, it was an unbelievable opportunity that we've gotten. He has been uh, instrumental. Um, he may be one of the main reasons where uh, our, our scores are running faster than the state right now on the IR, which is really great. And uh, McCall has identified him as being one of the reasons for uh, them being a blue ribbon and uh, b being our highest performing score, uh, uh, school in the district. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was honored this uh, past uh, few months by uh, Dr. Takahashi, who invited me to come with him to witness lesson study in action because we're looking at bringing this opportunity to the to the district as a whole. So we want to be able to uh, uh, bring lesson study, which is a simple idea. Teachers collaborate with each other to develop lessons, plan lessons, in order to uh, to increase student achievement. It's all about pedagogy. The whole thing is about pedagogy, and so. Uh, he invited me, and this is a select opportunity. They invite about 30 to 40 people a year. That's it. And uh, he said, uh, uh, we'd be happy to have you come and help launch this in Waukegan. So do you have any questions about that? Yeah, what does pedagogy, what does, pedagogy, what does that mean? Pedagogy is a fancy word <laughs> for the science uh, an art of teaching and learning. And so pedagogy is basically why a teacher gets into the craft of teaching. They want to change kids' lives. They see, what, they see when a kid doesn't understand, and the science and art of teaching comes into play right there. And pedagogy, uh, a, a teacher with great pedagogy will actually be able to figure out what's going on in the kid's mind and help them get over and get them to learn what they need to learn. Pedagogy is the heart of all teaching. So I thought that's what it meant, problem solving. I'm sorry? Problem solving. Problem solving is a yeah. nice way of putting it. Yeah. I just, yeah. I went too much. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Go ahead. Oh, Ms. Hannah, and then we've got. Yeah, I, I just want to know, um, I'm a little bit confused as to why, um, why you are, um, why you're, responsible for your own international airfare? Uh, that's just a, a deposit and the reimbursement. Huh? That's not 
the, the, the airfare is the way it was set up, but that's just a deposit. We're, we're going to ask for that. He, he just he, he took care of that himself to start off with, but that's, that's what the item is for, is to request for him to go. Jen, Jennifer, may I step to the mic so sure. everyone can hear me? Sure. So that, that's what we're requesting right now, is that um, he, he's going to take this trip. Jennifer Rice de Los Sanchez has budgeted for this in, in her budget, but um, Matt took, took the initiative to register ahead of time so, so that he could reserve a spot. Mm -hmm. So we're asking for permission, and then we, we are we have already budgeted for it. Mm -hmm. So, he'll so be after you all approve, right? He'll right? We're we're, we're we're going to take we're going to take take care of it. We're not asking him to pay this. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's why the items here is to ask for your permission to or your approval on this item when it goes to the board uh, meeting um, next. It'd be week. nice if you use that word. We're going to reimburse him. Right. Yeah, that, that's you, well. I, I think I don't know if we're going to reimburse him or if we're just going to pay for it. Yes, but we kept, budgeted for it. Thank, yeah, thanks. See, you kept we're, saying we budgeted. I mean, budget. just say we we're going to reimburse him. Right. Well, right. we're going to pay for it. How about that? Yes. yes. Once right. you approve it, there you go. Right. Um, Mr. Grimes. Oh, sorry. There's Mr. a question. Grimes, I, mean, I had yeah. a comment. Too. Yeah, Mr. Grimes, go ahead. Right. We we got a mic there so everyone can hear. Go ahead. Oh, 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 sorry. I said you guys might not know that Matt and I used to share an office together. Turn it and on. We also share a common spirit in that. Okay. There. Yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> that okay. Why well, am I repeat myself? So you're gonna hate me. Maybe a minute longer. But seriously, I think it's just important to let everybody know who Matt is. I said, we used to share an office together. Beyond that, I've witnessed Matt over at Brookside, for example, just sitting and then doing one-on-one -on -one with students in math. So not only does he walk, talk to talk, but he walks the walk. Mm -hmm. And he's offered to do more. He wants to meet with the ministers, and we might eventually set that up, Matt, you know, with the council we have. So he goes to a church that really participates in Lake Forest. But the, the, the spirit that he has, the dedication I've witnessed, and when he's out teaching or helping other teachers, he's doing it by example. And so I really, really want to compliment him and embarrass him in front of everybody. Thank well, you. You did a good job. All right, all right, thank you. Okay, and Ms. Gonzalez, you had a question. Yeah, just really briefly. Um, I love this. I think, I think, um, you know, for, for people at home or in the audience in the community, I think what is talked about um, in regards to pedagogy is so important because it's not just having the staff, it's about empowering the staff to reach different kinds of students in the, in the ways that they learn best. Um, so, so that is really important because you can't just lecture, you gotta, you gotta figure out what, what's going on in the student's mind to understand, okay, this is where, you, this is where they're at and this is why they're not getting the, the answers um, correct mm -hmm. and so I, I think um, this is really important I, I had a question about um, the cohort so so would this be the catalyst of you starting the cohort here or who is a part of the cohort in Waukegan yeah so this is the catalyst there's three okay. co there's one cohort running right now okay. it is uh, McCall Little Fort and Greenwood okay thank you um, and uh, the next cohort will be next year and this is this is a gradual process because it has to be done well. It can't be just thrown out, and it, it's going to grow. And the schools themselves work with the other schools to develop the pedagogy of teaching and learning. So mm -hmm. it has to grow. Up. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Ms. Hannah. Okay, and so okay, uh, is that that's elementary. Mm -hmm. What about our middle schools and our high schools? Can I, can I just so so that's that's where we're starting, but it, it's also something that we can use in, in in middle school and in high school. It's 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 not just that's just where 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 Matt um, started, but he can speak more about it too. But um, you, you know, I had high schools when I was in in uh, Chicago public schools. I had high schools that were 
a high school that was participating in it that I think Matt you still work with PJ right yeah. yep so um, there it's just again <coughs> developing this it does start out slow and just to reiterate a point that he made um, to do it well you, you really you're, you have this cohort so that you're developing these skills and then you can have the, the teachers work with other teachers so um, Dr. Takahashi last year uh, had a cohort of middle school so uh, that was in teaching through problem solving there's two steps to this and then we had that cohort it was very successful um, it was uh, three of the middle schools were involved in it and we are going to build it up but we can't just throw it if, if you know so we are this is definitely a movement that we want to grow well right mm -hmm. right Right. So it's already in the process. Okay. Yes, Ms. Legazamo. Um, thank you for the presentation. And uh, I know that as you introduced this a, a while ago, um, you had that plan about the different cohorts and how it's going to be rolled out. Um, but I was wondering, um, ha is there anything that you're seeing that is causing a, a hurdle by, by any means? Um, technological wise classroom wise or anything like that just trying to get your feedback um, how the board can uh, add more resources additionally help out in um, advancing as many cohorts as possible in Waukegan I really appreciate the those messages um, I think uh, the board has already um, done many things to help this move along I, as as uh, things come up, you may hear some more, but I am really um, proud of this board as to kind of teaming with other, uh, uh, with world renowned teachers. Um, Waukegan will also uh, work with one of the cohorts in San Francisco. And that cohort will work together to help develop us as well. So this is not um, an isolated thing. Mm -hmm. And that cohort in San Francisco went, is an inner city cohort with um, a 100% minority population. Mm -hmm. And they went from last to uh, the top 25 in their district in three years. Wow. wow. So wow. it's possible. That's amazing. And, um, you know, just thinking, you know, I've seen, especially like in, in the middle schools, but where there's an increase of technology being used, right? And there are some people that um, say that the increase of technology is not helping um, the mental math. Um, just kind of wanted to get your, your take a little bit on that. Like, um, is, there, is there something, you, do we have a good balance, right? Is what I'm looking at. I, th I see our district having a really good balance right now. I love technology, but I love teachers, and teachers are the ones that make the technology work. And yeah. Amen. and uh, with the teachers uh, developing their craft with mm -hmm. each other, this is a teacher to teacher thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When they develop their craft, Katie by the door. Mm -hmm. Excited. Thank you so much. Those are all mm -hmm. my questions, Vice President. Right. Right. Another question for the audience? Oh, yes. Ms. Meyer, go ahead. So I'd like to just, um, again, give kudos to Matt. He has been tremendous um, for our schools, for our children. Uh, Matt has been tremendous um, bringing on and supporting Everyday Math, the University of Chicago Everyday Math program, which is going to elevate our students as we continue to implement that. And I know that at Greenwood, we've been following the lessons, the TTP lesson study process now for going on four years mm. and so we are excited um on november 16th uh mccall will be hosting a second grade lesson study in the morning and greenwood will be hosting a fourth grade lesson study in the morning dr takahashi and members from the um alliance the illinois alliance will be there these are individuals who are supporting our teachers as we uh, continue to learn the process so we invite you to come to mccall in greenwood on the 16th um, to meet Dr. Takahashi, as well as seeing the amazing work our teachers and students are, are, are going through. Um, this is an opportunity that's going to move our students forward um, and take them to the next level. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Meyer.
for inviting the boards. I think some of us will take well, you up on that. that. November, November 16th. 16th. Should we call you in advance for that? Yeah, and just November 16th, 8 o'clock to uh, 11 o'clock, have a call. Oh, have a call. And Greenwood um, in the afternoon, same date, 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock. 1 to 4. Okay. Well, okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you, Mr. Foster. Okay, Mr. S Dr. Cesario, if you want to take sure. the next item. Sure. Um, the next one is regarding cybersecurity for the district, uh, and this is uh, the firewall that, that uh, Dr. Cuevas mentioned earlier. Right. It's the Palo Alto Firewall Annual Maintenance Renewal. Again, it is uh, a renewal, and it is annual. Um, the amount for $322,400, and this also comes from the ITS local funds. <coughs> Right. I told many, many years ago, when we started getting Anyone? technology mm -hmm. into our school district, it was said then that technology was going to cost oh. a lot of money. It does. And I am seeing that from where we were mm -hmm. with getting where we began with the technology mm -hmm. and that was years ago yeah and where we are now and it would be really interesting to see the grand total of how much money uh, that our um, our technology has uh, mm -hmm. has cost the district over the years, I, I agree. It, it's it's a an increasing cost on an annual basis, and the more complex things get in terms of cyber attacks and what what people are doing, the the more that we have to spend to protect. It's not something we like to do. Mm -hmm. We'd rather put the money elsewhere, but it's something that we need to do again. Just to reiterate a point that Dr. Cuevas made, in order to keep our our teachers, our faculty, our staff, our students, uh, and parents safe. The, and, our, the, and our data and and our well yes this and that's the way the to protect them right, right. because they right. they look for students uh, and to take their their social security numbers and other things so you know it's just this I is understand. oh no I know I you do yeah. it's unfortunate yeah I would yeah. really can you can you all I'm requesting to get the uh, the dollar amount we, we can we, we can uh, definitely do that right. we, we can definitely do that because it's it's part of the annual budget so we we can we can look that back uh you know five years if you want that's that's not a uh that's not an impossible request it's yeah we can do that no problem right but there's not much we can do about it there's not much right. we can do about it, it. you can't can. no. but no but it doesn't but that. but you're definitely right it, it has been an it increasing cost and it yes. probably will continue to increase right. and I'm, a, I'm yes. just interested sure and we can look at that I'm sure as long as that doesn't take too much time of staff yeah, to do that I don't think so we just right. look at it, the it, ITS we, budget it not a problem take a that no staff no it's all in the system that's that's correct we can we can look back okay. for sure mr. McBride I just want to echo what miss Hannah is saying and in uh, I, I get where you're coming from just like a cell phone, they went from I one to I fifteen, and it's gonna go. keep going on, and you're yeah, gonna keep right. paying more it. and more for it. That's right, right, right. I yeah. still, I still got an Android yeah. that costs twenty nine dollars, and I, it's right. doing the same thing. It still works, right? Time. There you go. Right, Miss Callahan, what's that? I'm finding in my industry that it used to be you could buy an application and own the application and use that application forever, but now they're going to a monthly or yearly. Fee. Is oh, yeah. that what's right. happening I mean, I to all our programming and stuff? Doc, Dr. Cuevas can speak to it, but that's exactly what it is, is that it's a, it's a way to have to continually to bring in money. Revenue, yeah. I mean, it's a similar to the model of, or what the iPhone is, that it's essentially the same thing. They add new things, they change a lens, and then they charge three times as much. Right. With, with these services, though, mm -hmm. instead of you buy, you know, it's, it's a reoccurring cost. Mm -hmm so that they have a, a continual oh. revenue stream, right? And we ha you have to do it because we, we have cyber attacks and there are constantly mm -hmm. people that are sitting in rooms trying to, to, to write code to break into everything that we're doing. So it's unfortunate, it's a reality though. Right. And it's, it's not just in education, it's across the board. Uh, right, no, right. yes, but uh, just. I it, just wanna yeah. know. Sure, I'm, right. I'm curious too. Yes. It'd be interesting to find right. that out. And right. That is something that we can definitely pull up, right. not okay. a problem. All right, thank you, thank you. Dr. 
Was this Aria, if you take item 5K now and let the record show that at 645 the superintendent joined us. Okay, so this one is another renewal, uh, another one out of ITS, um, <laughs> Aruba, Aruba ClearPass Wireless Maintenance. And uh, so this, this helps to support the district's wireless equipment infrastructure. So the, the wireless hubs and access points so, uh, so that we can have uninterrupted and quick internet um, and, and that we are um, able to use it uh, simultaneously across mm -hmm. the district within buildings. Okay. Did I sum that up all right? All right. Sounds good. All right, if there's no questions, let's take. Yeah, I got. Oh, you got a well, question. Ms. Handy, I just, a, yeah, I just hey, want to ask the question. Right. And our, our, our phone system is done, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're good, right? Everything it's is back. Up. Yeah, it's back. It's okay, back up. Very good. Back up. Okay. And um, let the record show that at uh, 648, the board president joined us. And, let's, and Dr. Cesario, if you take item uh, 5L. This is oh, uh, oh, is, oh, is there, oh, okay. Oh, go ahead. Was there oh, a question? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, yes, uh, Mr. McIntyre, you have a question? I, I do. Um, let me see. How do I frame this? Um, so all of the supports that are given to uh, K through five, K through six, great. Um, I'm curious, and this may be strong language, but I still would like some sort of an answer. Um, what about the supports for 9 through 12? That's what I'm asking. Versus K through 5. It shouldn't be a competition, right? But it should be equal treatment across the board because these are the young people that are going into the workforce mm -hmm. and they need that academic support just as well as anyone else in the district. So can we get, can I receive some sort of understanding as to what type of supports sure does that population of students receive? Sure, and so you're talking in reference to some of the earlier items about the materials that were purchased, sure. Yes. And so I, I think it's a very valid question because it looks like a lot of what we talked about was primarily for um, our, our intermediate and our, our, our middle school. So we, do, we did mention uh, most recently uh, Hey Tutor, which is a, again a tutoring program that would, would apply to our, our, our upper grade, our middle, our high school students. But we also do purchase materials for our, our high school students. The quantity that we do it, it, it may not be the, the same and the frequency with which we're doing it might not be the same, but it, it doesn't mean that we're not purchasing materials and supports for those students. Some of the technical, uh, some of the technology that we've purchased, we've had large technology purchases. Um, and a lot of those uh, texts, we, we just reviewed another text for another course at the high school level. So it's woven in throughout. I think uh, it's an it's a excellent question that you're asking because it, it seems, this evening, it seems like it's a little skewed. Um, can the other, can I also mention gonna, something? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I, I think, um, and, and this is me as a board member kind of chiming in, so if other board members feel different, please please uh, feel free to speak. But I think um, the, the strategy is, is starting at the youngest level because if you, don't, if you don't start with a good foundation in example math, algebra is gonna be really hard. Um, that's, just, that's just the facts, right? And so the strategy is to create a really solid foundation at the K through five level and then by the time high school hits and you're still struggling, the, the strategy there is intervention. We're, we got the tutoring. Teachers are, are sometimes doing those one-on-ones with students. And I can attest, I had really great math teachers. Some of my math teachers are still teaching in the district at the high school level. And, and so, so the intervention is different there, right? Because now it's not just the foundation that you're having a, a problem with, but also the, the content. Um, so I, I think that kind of supplements uh, Dr. Cesario's point, but I think it also encourages us to say, okay, if we catch them and, and we're proactive about our youngest students, hopefully by the time they hit middle school and high school, they have what, they, what, what content they need to have learned to have a strong foundation. Same thing with reading as well. Um, knowing phonics, hopefully you know, we catch the students up by grade level so that way they, they can continue reading. Um, that's just how I'm seeing like yeah. the supports, but yeah. that, that um, K 
can I just comment to there and then I'll, sure. I'll I, I think that is that that's accurate um, we are also looking at other supports and we have we we've also invested money in social emotional learning supports and counseling supports and so we, we're really trying to look across the board I know Miss Hannah has talked a lot about the science of reading and that's something else that we're working on and that's something that you would teach at all grade levels especially uh, at the high school level so that our students who may need extra support uh, with reading and that's something that's in development but just like uh, Matt Foster said with 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 um, the Japanese lesson study these are things that we're developing they're not all pushed out at once because it takes time to develop them um, so we're, we are working on things like that and we are we're continuing to purchase materials and supports right now um, some of this is, is 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 geared towards the elementary in the spring we had a, a long list of renewals and purchases that were were for uh, elementary middle and high school if Sorry, I may, I, if I may um, Ms. Gonzalez uh, I, I fully understand the concept of teaching kids early mm -hmm. I got that but it shouldn't come at the expense of oh the students in the higher grades so my point is not that we should not focus on educating our younger people and giving them the supports that they need my point is that it should not come at the expense we shouldn't forfeit four grade levels because we're focused on one part the school district is huge right you have an entire staff we can walk and chew bubble gum at the same time and there should be that same focus on that population of students <laughs> as there is for the younger. It shouldn't be either or. And that sounded to me a lot to be either or. So I don't, I don't agree with that on any level. If that's what your point was, I don't agree with that. No. But I will say also, Mr. Cesario, Dr. Cesario, um, the, the SEL support the interventions even if you just think about that, it sounds like the problem has already happened and we need to fix the problem, which we need to do that by way of interventions. We need to do that by way of coming in and healing a wound that's already been that caused. We need academic supports mm -hmm. on that level, not simply um, Band-Aids, if you will. So I really just wanted to make that point very clear that I'm speaking about academic supports. Yes coupled with the rest Agreed. of it. Agreed. And, and as I, I just want to make it clear that I, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. It, it takes a balance. It's not just one. I was citing some examples, but you're, you're absolutely right that it does take academics and it does take SEL. Um, that I, I, I just, again, want to say that it does, we're not foregoing one or giving to one and not to the other. Mm -hmm. um, so that some of the purchases were made earlier earlier on and some more later and there there happen to be more purchases on on this agenda i i do appreciate the concern and and Dr. we are Cesario, can i jump in too i also think that there's a difference between um equity and equality and i heard you say equality so what we're giving the um, elementary middle school and high school the reality is maybe the high school may need more in comparison to the elementary or maybe the middle school may need more so the focus is not about what what one gets all gets um, in schools it's about an equity movement in which we look at individual schools that the community surrounds and supply um, the resource that's needed there so at the high school more resources may be needed there um, and so there is a high school transformation plan and a middle school redesign plan. Um, I know you're not covering that today, but if you want to set some time with Dr. Cesario, he can walk you through that, um, as he has previously on other um, on another topic that you had asked about. And so you could look at that of uh, what supports have been um, added, um, what the academics look like, um, what does MTSS and SEL look like at the high school, um, so that you can actually see that broad view. Mr. McIntyre. I, I need it to be made very clear that I, I don't need to be educated on the definition of equity. That's not what I'm saying at all. I know what e equity is. I'm saying to you that the students at the high school level are failing. Yes. They're failing. And if they're failing, they need support. They need mm -hmm. academic support. So it's not about 
the imbalance and if the lower level schools are receiving this then I'm think I'm saying to you what well, that means that the high school students should get the same thing I'm not saying that at all I'm simply saying based on the problem that exists at the high school level these students need academic support Absolutely. and I'm saying that based on the math the math says they're failing especially when it comes to the black population and nobody wants to specify that, but that's what needs to happen. We need to lock in and look at where are the deficiencies at. Why is it that these students are failing at the rate that they are? Is it because they're being suspended at nauseum and they're not in school? Is that what it is? Because that has nothing to do with academics. But whatever the problem is, it needs to be addressed because the students are failing. And when they do, they don't come back to school. And when they don't come back to school, where are they going? They're going to the block, man. So, and there's nothing there waiting on them except prison or death. This is real, and I'm dealing with it every day. Yeah. These kids are coming to me, so this is real to me. So I don't, I don't want any sort of the condensation, the condescending. I don't, I don't like that because it's real to me as these students and their parents come to me asking me for help. So can now, I? So first, I I just like to understand what block man means so that I can more address that. But um, the corner where individuals sell drugs at. Okay, so when you. the students are suspended and they have nothing better to do, they go to the streets. What I meant by the block, they go to the streets where individuals sell drugs to individuals who are desperate and they need it. Whatever their reasons are, they should have been in school, but they were not in school. So okay, that's where they're going. Go Okay, and and my thing is, I, I'm I am going to echo what um, Mr. McIntyre is saying, and you all sitting here, you have heard me constantly talk about our upper grade students, and see, we worked very uh, diligently on getting our elementary schools in order for the past past five six years okay and we're still working on the elementary and yes i understand that there's going to be uh some kind of redesign for the middle school and some kind of transformation for the high school and all that all of that systemic stuff that that is not to me it's not priority what's priority is the educational attainment academic attainment of our upper grade students that are getting ready to be to leave our schools with an education that will sustain them in their future and if we are not doing that then what are we, when they walk across that stage and get a diploma, what type of diploma is it going to be? What is it? What quality is it? So um, you know, thank you for your comments about that and, and that it is, it is something that we're working on and, and understand the sense of urgency around it. I just want to note that you have to have a plan and, and we have to use, yeah. we have, so, that's what the high school transformation plan is. It's a plan. But and it, it involved, but if I may, if I may, thank you. It involved, it involved the administrators, it involved the teachers, and it involves a, a five-year comprehensive plan. I, I can't speak to what happened before. I, I, I can speak to where we're at yes. right now. I can speak to, to those things. I know that um, we have made improvements. I, I know it's not as fast as we all would like. But I do know that change takes time, especially in education. Um, and I, I, I understand the, the point that you're making that let's, let's call it out and, and where are these supports and how are they intentional and strategic? And that's part of the work that we're trying to do as well, to be very strategic and to address the needs as they're presented on both sides, social, emotionally and academically. And, and, and you're right, there, is, there has to be a sense of urgency around this because for a lot of our students, it is life or death. You're absolutely right, Mr. McBride. I want to acknowledge that. And, Mr. And McIntyre. I'm sorry, Mr. McIntyre, I'm sorry. But um, it, it is, that, that's what we're, we're striving towards, that's what we're working towards. It's not that we don't, we're not listening. Um, and so I, I just want to acknowledge that, that these plans are in place 
and, and that we are we're working on it and we are seeing we are seeing improvements are the improvements making huge no they're incremental but we are we are seeing them I think tonight we'll, we'll talk about some of the, the the work that we're doing and some of what we're seeing um, and, and we'll move from there but point well taken we'll, we'll continue to examine that and address it intentionally right if if uh, if it is our, our african-american students that are, are how are we addressing it specifically what how are we targeting those students right as well as other student groups that need the support absolutely absolutely you're, you're I think we're all we're all in agreement and so um, I want to say one last thing superintendent Placencia the look on your face when certain things are said is mind-blowing to me it's like you you take for joke it seems like the things that are most serious to the population that seems to be the most adversely affected by the things that I'm speaking on and I don't understand what's funny about it so mr. McIntyre I never addressed this but to me that comment is very sexist Sexist? And, yes, very sexist. And so okay. I can look at my team, I can smile, I can look down. It, it, it's perception. My, my demeanor, my look, I mean, whatever you want to characterize it, I'm paying attention. I offered you a meeting with Mr. Cesario, Dr. Cesario, if you would like to learn more of the high school. You even said that I was being condescending. No, I was not being condescending. I was offering you an opportunity to come in and sit with the team to get more knowledge around the plans that we have presented previously. I am fully aware of the plans that you guys spoke on before. When you speak about sexism, I fully understand the definition of that as well, and I suppose that's in the eye of the beholder. I'm not a sexist individual, but what I am saying to you is that when an individual is standing before you and they're speaking about matters of seriousness and you smiling, it sounds and looks to me like that is something that you're not taking seriously. Now. I don't want to go back and forth. You've told me what your position is. I respect your position. But I hope you can also see where I'm coming from because empathy has to be on the table as well. Can and I when, agree? I'm, when I'm saying to you that these young people are coming with tears in their eyes, I hope that that matters to you on some level. Right? So I will just leave the subject alone because I think I've made my point, but I definitely don't want to be categorized as being sexist because that's not me. And I can accept your perception and I want you to know that because I'm smiling, I smile all the time. Um, if I was a man up here smiling, I don't think that you would have that same perception. Um, but I do care about all of our students. There are plans in place um, and more plans coming in place to address all subgroups based off the Illinois School Report Card and a specific plan coming in place to address the student achievement of our African American males. And when you leave that and you say that if this was a man, I would treat it differently, no, I wouldn't. I'm saying to you, whoever is sitting in that seat, I would expect them, male, female, young or old, black or white, to treat what I'm saying or anyone else in the audience is saying with the same amount of respect. So it doesn't matter to me who's there. That's a guess on your part what I would do if it was a man. It isn't true because I know me. I, I just want, I want, I, I understand plans, but plans and implementation are two different things. And so we need to see through all of these plans that, that, that's being talked about, discussed, or whatever, now is the time yeah. for Great. implementation. So I think, Dr. Cesario, uh, at this point, we have addressed the issue. If you want to bring back, uh, maybe we can ask the um, high school team to yeah. come back and just give an update on the Most implementation, definitely. right? We, we did that today, and I was going to say we're implementing and mo more than happy to, to share the updates the with you. Yep. No, nope, we are, and we'll show you. We can show you at another meeting whenever you want. Ms. Okay. Cazamo. Sure. Thank you, Board President. Um, also, the, the middle school redesign three-year plan had um, came to a close. So um, we would need also an update on the middle school sure. redesign, right, and what that looks like. Um, but as, as board members, when we're looking at the strategic plan and how we can implement that end goal, and we're doing that strategic planning right now, it, 
it would almost, as we're talking about um, equity and specific student groups, is that something that we want to include in our strategic plan? Do we want to have specific sub student subgroup uh, information tackled in, in a lot of those different areas? So, I mean, there are areas and ways that we can push that end goal, um, and that's doing it through, through our board work as well. We just had a strategic plan, and in that strategic plan, I didn't say not one word, but what Mr. McIntosh is expressing tonight, mm -hmm. we didn't touch that at all, period. Right. And uh, I would say, as he was saying, serious about uh, our students that were, that's being uh, expelled in detention, yep. uh, gangs, drugs, you're never going to move forward academically if you don't have those values in place. Mm -hmm. And those are some of the things that I think that we're missing in terms of behavior that's going on in our schools right now. Uh, and we need to address that. I see where he's coming. I hear him when he made the comment in reference to if we don't do what we need to do, they go to the block. And when they go to the block, the consequences, there's two things. It's either the graveyard or Dr. Bublis, as you would say, penitentiary, you use another word, I think. Uh, what's the word you always use when they leave our district? Penal list. That's it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's right. I think that's what Anthony is ex ex Oh, definitely. Not, 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 I don't have to say I think. I'm, yes. I'm black, too. Mm -hmm. And I understand where he's coming from. And it, 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 it touches me as well. And we, we, we need to start addressing that. And the, and the bottom line to it is... Uh, Starting from the bottom is great, but at the same time, you got to get to the top. And when you get to the top, uh, if you ain't where you should be, though the end result of that is what he's speaking about. And like I said, I said in that strategic plan uh, the other day, I didn't say not one word, but the things to me that's important, uh, nobody never brought them up or talked about it. And that's the bottom line to right. Lucy. Yeah, I agree. And um, I, I agree with you, Mr. McBride, right? So what... What does that all look like um, holistically, right? Because we know, um, as we're, we're when when our students are suspended, there is an increased risk out there. Uh, when our students uh, are not in school, there is an increased risk. Um, when our students can't perform academically, there's an increased risk, right? As we know, all those different. Uh, anybody's done the ACE um, uh, things, right? Like mm -hmm. a, a lot of our students come with um, burden and a lot of that is an increased risk mm -hmm. to our students. And that's also how the reason why the importance of community and buildings and, and the school relationship is very important, right? Because what happens in the community happens in the schools. What happens in the schools happens in the community. We have this relationship and so it's it's not even it's not even just a school issue, but we also need to make sure that we're making those connections in our community as well. I mean, it's 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 a very big whole complex thing. I I definitely think, but when it comes to especially the academic supports, what he was uh, what Mr. McIntyre was referencing, this is where the high school transformation um, plan that has the pillar in there, specifically somebody that's going to be um, accountable for looking at the academic uh, map of the high school programming. Um, that's also where our college and career um, plan comes into play. I mean, this is where all of all of all of those things that we've been trying to tackle in regards to the academic the piece. course offering guide. To, there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a lot of things. And there's been supposed things, yeah. to, you know, and but there's still more, right? There, yeah. there there's still a lot more and we're, we're not even touching the surface right but we've had, we've had all of that before course offerings the catalogs the, the school schedules where <clears throat> students could go and pick their classes what they wanted and not be tracked into this one and that one because they're uh, their counselors say this is where they want to go they had the opportunity to choose their own classes and that has disappeared and so um, we, we there's things that were happening in District 60 forever and I'm not sure where we have evolved to now. 
I mean, and so, right? Like we've grown up here, right? We've so, we've had a that's generations. I think, I think let's let's have yeah. the, that conversation. Yeah, definitely. Things were done. Where we are now is not where we were. Um, the graduation rate when I graduated was not yeah. much higher than it is today. Uh -huh. So what I will say is what I heard from the community is that there is an issue, a crisis. We know that students, especially last year, there was a significant failure rate. We looked at revising our entire graduation policy because of that failure rate. And so Deputy Cesario, while it's definitely not, uh, at least I'm not, and I'll say that publicly, I'm not blaming you for the state. No, I'm not taking I know you're it not that taking way. Yeah. What I will say is that what the expectation is, is what are we doing to address the failure rate? And we just want to state it in explicit terms so that when asked, we can very eloquently and efficiently and effectively speak mm -hmm. to the community to say that we're doing A, B, C, D, E, and F, and this is the outcome that we hope it will have, right? Uh, and that we're progress monitoring that. So instead of going around and around when we all agree that we are, <laughs> are failing, what I will say is we've already committed to bringing it back and having a high school uh, report yeah. mm -hmm. on implementation and that we have had great things that have happened in Waukegan for years, decades. Great things come from Waukegan, I say it all the time, but mm -hmm. we also, also have had systemic issues and challenges. And so even when we had those course offerings, we weren't looking at an 80 or 90 or 95% graduation rate. That is the reality. And so I think we have to acknowledge both things is that we have to move forward, but we also have to talk about that there have been things that we, you know, that were a problem before, mm -hmm. um, things that we gave up, Ms. Hannah, that were working, that we shouldn't have given up. And I think that that is, we can all acknowledge that, things that we want to do differently. Um, and you have much more of the experience and the longevity and the history and 20 some years knowing what we've tried and not tried and did and didn't do where some people in this room don't have that context. So to say that we had do it, had it, agreed. To say that we may have it or a different iteration or need to bring it back today, agreed. And um, what I will say is that there's important beginning of your data that I think will support the conversation that we're having. And so instead of going back and around on this, there may be questions that that prompt. So I'm gonna ask for us to move to item 6A, which is the beginning of year data presentation. Right, if there's one more item that on there, are you okay that. with that? Right, we didn't do that one. The one you're talking about, L. Yeah, is there for information? Are there questions on it from either the community or the board? I just wanna make sure you all saw it, that's all. Brendan, I'd just like to say one thing. I want to say with the strategic plan that we had last night, uh, I will echo, Mr. Riddle did bring up something important out of that, and that he made clear that every student is not going to college. Every student is not, it's, may graduate, but they're not going to college. He did bring up some issues, and I thought it was important. He started talking about vocational. He made reference to, uh, in this world now, we have to have RN, we have nurses. Uh, he also brought up... Uh, there's other, uh, there's other, uh, uh, there's other uh, professions, occupations out there mm -hmm. that we could be offering our students uh, to uh, get them prepared for that. So he did bring that up, and, and like I say, every student is not going to college. And, and but I'm every not, student needs to be. Educated they may, Miss Hannah, but it's not. That's it, I'm just the, the bottom line to it. Every student's not going to college. Mm -hmm. So. I, that's right. That's exactly what I said. And I agree. I agree, but you still should have some options. <clears throat> no options? <laughs> no options? But there should be the opportunity there but the, for students to decide whether or not they're going to go. And so and that's you kind the of where I said, I'm saying, no, it's you quite You said the same different. thing I'm saying, but he brought those, he put those Sir, opportunities on Mr. the table. Mr. McBride, it's quite different. <coughs> the fact that we already know that every student is not going to go, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't have, uh, no. the students shouldn't have the opportunity to to decide what it is they want to do. But they need and, the and opportunity. Uh, Since Mr. McBride is talking, we need to offer them uh, opportunities yes. to choose other fields as well. They all need to be prepared for life. They all need to be prepared to read and write and, and, and to think critically, but also <laughs> they have to be engaged. And if we lose them because we only offer college as an opportunity, 
and we gear everything toward college, then we're going to lose the kids who aren't interested in going to college. We, we need to engage <coughs> them as well in opportunities and get them engaged in many of the jobs out there that our communities will continue to have, like HVAC and stuff. This is not the time, I think, for us to be d having this conversation, though. We have a, a this is a committee right meeting. Uh, you know, and it seems to me we are way off track tonight. We, we, we spent a lot of time on a very important topic, I, I echo Mr. but it's but it's not what we're this committee meeting is for tonight. So I'd like to call us back, board president, to finish our agenda for tonight. It's and, and as you've offered many times, we're going to come back to this conversation again and again. And, and Dr. Cesario has already committed to tell us what we are doing on the high school end of it. So I, I'd like to move forward with item 5L. So if there were no questions for 5L, which is where we were, which related to the fall at Destiny renewal, I'm asking that we move to 6A, which I is- I wanted to know what, what that was. So, so um, that is a library inventory system to, to renew that. So in, ter in terms of how we scan and keep track of the inventory, what goes in, what comes out, um, is that does that pretty much and textbooks too thank you and textbooks too so everything has to be barcoded and scanned in right. so that we can keep track of the inventory right okay okay Ms. Leguizamo does um does that system help to um, maintain the list of um, the type of books uh, like by subgroups like does it have is it is it written by a uh, Hispanic author black author female author male author is it characters in there of people of color just well or, the, just I mean all, what the goal is um, to ensure that we have culturally relevant literature available mm -hmm. in terms of the system and whether or not you can sort by by that I'll have to um, ask uh, Miss Massimo to speak to that okay so that is that is a possibility yes um, and I'm working with our Follett um, coordinator right now to run those reports for our libraries at all of our individual schools so it will disseminate information about um, authors of minority women um, of color of all, all sorts of, of language um, so it will it, it will give us a good depiction and where we need to move forward in our libraries and there's you know there's an effort every year to make purchases for the languages that are supported and um, are uh, indigenous in our schools. To be reflective of our, the cultures right. that are yeah, represented. I appreciate that because um, as we were at the, the last conference for ALAS, um, they had talked a lot, it was Scholastic, uh, that had mm. talked a lot about representation being represented, being represented in our schools, right? And that being, of course, in, in literature as well. Um, yeah, I'd like, I definitely love, once when all of that is kind of put in place and settled down a bit, I love a report to the board and uh, superintendent, I'll task you with this, to see what is the offerings and the diversity and the cultural response of, of, of all of our books within the different schools and how that looks, uh, especially re with representation. So yeah. thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Anna. you or you and sure, please. the superintendent. Um, I I owned a bookstore, and mm -hmm. I have boxes of literature, and I would love to be able to donate to the high school where you could have a section of African American authors. I love it. And that, that, I don't know where that would come through you sure. or whoever, but I would love to donate those boxes of uh, that literature. Uh, I mean, and really for a kid's enjoyment reading, sure. but you know what enjoyment reading does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It increases reading. Right. And so, um, I have those. Well, let's work together to get them here. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Ms. Massimo. Thank you, Ms. Hannah and Ms. Leguizamo. Thank you. And we are now at 6A, beginning of the year data presentation. All right. I'll ask uh, Dr. Brown and Dr. Nolte to, to come up.
Good evening, hey, Superintendent, Board Brian. President, members of the board. Brian. We have um, this evening we'll be presenting on our uh, beginning of year data. Uh, Dr. Brown and his team um, has put together our NWA data for um, the fall that our students took recently, um, as well as our five essentials data, which you'll see tonight, this evening as well. Um, the presentation is recorded, so there's a recording that we'll listen to that'll walk you through the slides. After the conclusion of the presentation, uh, we will answer any questions you may have. Uh, oh, it's pre-recorded again? There is the, the attachment of the of the deck is on the uh, um, board docs as well as um, was sent to the board I think uh, yesterday as well or Monday mm -hmm. yesterday. Mm -hmm. So, Looks like we might have to replay or restart this one. There it is. Remember that technology we were talking about earlier this evening? Right, right. <laughs> Give us one second here. Again, we're going to go through everything. And I'd like to see the big picture. You know, just kindergarten our kids are still reading below grade level first grade most of them still below grade level you know way below um, so we've got a you know well below you know they could have, they could, you just wonder if they could speak to this instead of you know and, and how we're doing if we're making progress second and third second and third it's still well below in fact it even goes Larger. The, the numbers. Bear with us for one minute. Ms. Hanna, if you want, here, Cooper Lebrun, if you can help. Secret Lebrun, Lebrun's back here in Tennessee. We use it for middle school through 12, not, not for the younger grade. Yes. She has a transportation issue. 
assessment and mentoring. Mm -hmm. We were hired for new cultural mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Carbonex, which I mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. and I don't really care. Trio and so, so that you can tell, when you look at this, I mean, just I'm trying to understand it. When you look at it, the kids yeah, yeah. in oh, kindergarten, we mentioned that one. you know, they're they're well below. You know, right, because that means they're coming. Four, yeah, they're coming in well below, 44% below in phonological, and then in finally mm -hmm. word recognition, it's even greater, 80 some percent. Mm -hmm. But then as you, you know, go to the first day, Brown, it drops Director the of Assessment and Data, alongside Dr. Jason Nall. Good evening, Superintendent Placencia, President Ewing, members of the board, and Waukegan community. I am Dr. Jonathan Brown, Director of Assessment and Data, alongside Dr. Jason Nall, Associate Superintendent. Tonight, we will provide an update on how our students are starting the year. Today, we will focus on our beginning of the year assessment results. Each year, we take some time to assess our students in reading, math, and science. These results help us understand where our students are performing relative to grade level benchmarks and can give us insight into some of the skills students are mastering and or need assistance with. The assessments of focus for today are the NWEA MAP and Amplify M class for students in kindergarten through eighth grade. Mm -hmm. But before we get into the assessment results, we want to share some information on student attendance thus far. That's fine. All right, so we have the presentation. Dr. Brown, are you going to do it live? Boy, President, I was going to suggest that, I guess it maybe, maybe it's only for me, but I, I would like to have somebody interpret these results and kind of summarize them. So myself and the public who aren't educators you know, and, and word that work with data like this could understand <coughs> how our district is doing compared to the past and, and how it's doing to the standard. In other words, our kids coming in, is our group of kids coming in well below the this, this standard of other school districts? Um, and then are we making some progress with them as they move through second and third grade? What, what are these stats really showing us? So he Instead does of have- Instead just looking at these stats and trying to understand, sure. there's so much data that comes at me sure. in these presentations that I leave here not knowing what we're really doing. There's a lot to, to digest. Um, and part of the, the format that we've included is uh, having a summary slide after each section of the uh, assessment to kind of highlight some of the things that you saw in that portion to kind of help you process it a little more. Right. Um, it is a lot of numbers. It's a lot of uh, information to look at. But um, anybody on the board, Dr. Nolt, that wants to look at this data and dive deeper into it could do so. But, it, it, but when we're making presentations like this for me and maybe for some of the general public, it would help me understand where we're at. If it was more of a summary by an expert standing up there like yourself or Dr. Brown telling me what this data is really showing about our district and where our concerns are. You know, that human element that the expert tells me this is what's happening and then I can ask an intelligent question. I get overloaded by this data. I don't know if anybody else, I'd like to know if the rest of the board feels this way. If not, I'll keep my mouth shut. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay uh, with either or. Um, I, I can read through the data. I'm a big data analytics person myself. Um, but if you, I mean, I'm also okay with them just going through the um, slides that highlights each of the data. Um, I will say, you know, there's, um, people that goes through this presentation and since it's already also pre-recorded it's also going to be made available out on our website as well where our families could go out and um, listen to the entire presentation in its in, in its entirety but I don't uh, so that's just two of us I don't I don't know how everybody else feels about it yeah I think people it was on the agenda people came tonight to hear it or tuned in because they wanted mm -hmm. or expected to to see it so yep. if we want to change it moving forward, but at the last presentation, it wasn't asked for a reduction in information. It was actually asked that it be broken down into different subgroups, which is why we are seeing this data again. Is that right, Dr. Brown? Yeah, a couple, a couple more things than that too, but uh, if I could 
describe our approach that we tried to take with this. Um, we're trying to answer anticipated questions of the board and of the uh, community and of the uh, uh, teachers that are in the uh, district. So we're trying to paint a good picture for you of this is where we are right now and trying to break it down into as many different areas that have been requested. It is a long uh, deck, but we try to chunk it into, uh, uh, as you would see a slide in here, we talk about uh, the whole district in terms of their grade levels. Then we talk about the individual schools mm -hmm. and how the individual schools do. Then we talk about the individual uh, race ethnicities that are uh, in the district. Um, and for all of those groups, and those are the only ways that we broke it down, we tried to then go through each of the subject areas. So in reading, if you're doing it in English, this is how you're performing. In Spanish, this is how you're performing. In math, the same way. And then we also have uh, science. So the intention is to try to make it as I really wanted to make it as clear as possible so that when a person that is not here picks up the slide deck, they can actually see that, okay, third grade, this is what's happening uh, in third grade in general. Now, we don't know the specifics. The person will not know that uh, third grade involves uh, adding and subtracting fractions or it, it involves uh, 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 being able to write paragraphs or whatever that particular skill might be. But in general, that's what NWEA MAP is about, to tell us in general in third grade, this is how our students uh, stand up. It's not necessarily intended to tell us how are we doing compared to Zion or Lake Forest or any other school, but it is intended to tell us in terms of national uh, norms, where are we? We'd like for all of our kids to be at that national level, which is close to, and when we say national level, we're saying average across the entire uh, uh, country. It doesn't mean that average across the entire country means college uh, uh, going or anything, but it's to at least tell us that where we are relative to that. So we use NWEA map for now at the beginning and the middle of the year to give us that sense so that when we're pointing to the end of the year IAR, that's where we're really wanting to know how things are going. So we need a sense of where we are now so that we can keep pushing towards where we want to be on IAR. And that's what the, the intent of the uh, uh, presentation was. It was to give you an idea, oh, I, I, I'm only in elementary school, so I'm interested in that. So I can go to that particular section and look at those. I'm interested in early reading. I can go to that section and look at that. I'm interested in uh, eighth grade math. I can go to that and look at that. It, it, it's not really intended for you to digest it all. Grade level benchmarks. It all. So, uh, I, but I was gonna ask for feedback and so I'm glad you started. <laughs> right. right. I think that we should go ahead and watch the video. You guys were generous enough to prepare it in advance for us, and I think we should see and review the data together uninterrupted until the end. The and year. we will be here for questions Yes. at the, at the end. Today, we will focus on our beginning of the year assessment results. Each year, we take some time to assess our students in reading, math, and science. These results help us understand where our students are performing relative to grade level benchmarks and can give us insight into some of the skills students are mastering and or need assistance with. The assessments of focus for today are the NWEA MAP and Amplify M class for students in kindergarten through eighth grade. But before we get into the assessment results, we want to share some information on student attendance thus far. Here we have student attendance percentages from the first day of school through October 7th of this year and the two prior years. The first year is 2019, chosen as the last year of regular attendance prior to the pandemic, followed by 2021 and 2022 years as we begin to normalize school attendance. In 2019, elementary and middle school students attended 96 and 95% of the time at the beginning of the school year, while high school students attended 90% of the time. 
Since returning to in-person instruction, elementary attendance has begun to rebound, while middle school and high school attendance has decreased slightly last year. Ensuring that all students are reading on grade level by the end of grade three continues to be an important district goal. This is where we will start. This year, schools were given a choice of instruments to use to measure student progress in learning to read. Most schools utilize Amplify's M-Class TRC Dibbles Lectura Suite, while others continued with the NWEA Map Fluency Adaptive Assessment. Both were created to measure very similar skills with reports and information for teachers geared toward informing their instruction and monitoring student progress. Both tests are available in English and Spanish. Results are displayed in terms of grade level expectations at this point in time. For today, we will focus on the phonological awareness, word recognition, fluency, and comprehension portions of the test, starting with kindergarten and moving up through the grade levels. Recall also that all schools are now utilizing the new Tier 1 CKLA phonics curriculum for students in kindergarten through third grade. This slide displays kindergarten students' performance in the area of phonological awareness. The phonological awareness portion of the test involves students blending and segmenting sounds. Students are tested according to the language of instruction. In English, approximately 29% of students tested are at or above fall expectations, while in Spanish, approximately 41% of students are at or above fall expectations. In the area of phonics word recognition, approximately 14% of kindergarten students tested in English and 11% of kindergarten students tested in Spanish are at or above fall expectations. All other students are approaching expectations or below the benchmark. As the year progresses, the expected levels for students will increase and the test will flag those that are below expectations in winter and spring. Here we have first grade students' performance in the area of word reading fluency. This is a step prior to the oral reading pass of passages that is required later in the school year. In English, 23% of first grade graders tested are at or above fall expectations. In Spanish, 34% of first graders tested are at or above fall expectations. Over one third of students in either language tested below expectations this fall. By second and third grade, students are asked to read orally and are asked questions about what they read. In English, 32% of students in second grade and 29% of students in third grade tested at or above expectations this fall. In Spanish, 30% of students in second grade and 32% of students tested in the, in the third grade scored at or above fall expectations. Almost 60% of students in each language tested below fall expectations across the district. Oral reading performance highlights. In kindergarten, almost a third of students in English and 40% of students in Spanish tested at or above fall expectations in phonological awareness. In the area of phonics word recognition, Fewer than 15% of students tested at or above fall expectations in either language. In first grade, 23% in English and 34% in Spanish tested at or above fall expectations, while more than a third of students in either language tested below expectations. And in grades two and three, almost a third of students in each grade and language read aloud at or above expected fall levels. Our local district level benchmark assessments are utilized to give us a sense of where student performance is at a moment in time prior to spring state assessments. 
These are additional data points used alongside curriculum and class-based assessments and assignments to help gauge how students are performing. NWEA is an adaptive test that allows students that are performing above grade level or below grade level to demonstrate what they understand and can do. The results in this BOY presentation are presented relative to national norms. Students in grades K through 8 test with NWEA in math, reading, and science. While we are continuing as a district to focus on end of year measures, year over year progress, and common formative assessments that are embedded within the curriculum, we continue to use assessments such as NWEA to give us a global indication of student achievement and growth at specific points during the year. The remaining BOI results will be presented by grade level, school, and race ethnicity. Those results will be relative to national norms. The final slides will show a projection of spring IER performance based on current fall results. Our EL department designates courses that should be taught in Spanish. Those courses are then assessed in Spanish, the language of instruction. When students are in grade levels that participate in state testing, they may also experience the NWEA reading assessment in English because the IAR reading and college board assessments are not offered in another language. This slide should be familiar to most of you, since thousands of schools across the nation use NWEA tests. We are able to view our student results relative to national norms. Results are divided into five performance levels, high, high average, average, low average, and low, with corresponding percentile levels. Students that score in the 70th percentile or above are more likely to score in the meet standards area of our state assessments. Students that score in the average or above levels are very likely to be able to access grade level content with few additional supports needed. Students that score in the low average and low levels are more likely to need additional supports to access grade level content. Here is one more slide that I'd like to review that might be familiar to some of you. It gives an example of how test expectations change over time. Students are expected to, and typically do, increase their achievement levels as measured by their test score as the year progresses. Students that do not increase their achievement levels fall behind. This means that, for example, a score of 197 corresponds to the 43rd percentile in the fall, but in the winter, the same score of 197 now corresponds to the 28th percentile. In the spring, that same score of 197 may correspond to the 20th percentile. In order for a student to keep pace with typical growth and or standing according to national norms, the student that starts with a score of 197 at the 43rd percentile would need to achieve a score of 203 to maintain the 43rd percentile in the winter. In the spring, the student would need to achieve a score of 208 just to remain at the 43rd percentile nationally. With that said, we are always looking for students to do more than typical growth in order to change their relative standing and approach grade level expectations. In essence, we are looking for students to move up from the lower three performance levels and for those in the top two performance levels to maintain. As you can see, it can take a lot for a student to maintain their relative standing. I also want to mention that we use the percentile rank to discuss student scores on this test because every grade level has a different range of writ or scale scores that are associated with the students in that grade level. Using percentiles and the performance bands gives us a common scale for a general discussion across grade levels. The NWEA MAP assessments were administered in August and September to students in grades kindergarten through eight. All schools participated and tested the majority of their students. Most that did not test were due to absences. The table on the top represents fall reading performance and counts 
in English, while the table on the bottom represents results in Spanish. A summary table like this is presented prior to each graph in the online version of this presentation for later reference. Here we have NWEA map reading performance in English for each grade level across the district. On the far right, we see that, the, that across the district, 19% of students scored in the top two performance levels, while 43% scored in the lowest performance level at this time. Most grade levels have 20% or more of tested students scoring in the top two performance levels, with kindergarten and first grade having the most at about 25%. Kindergarten also had the lowest proportion of students scoring in the lowest performance level. This assessment for kindergarten and first grade does not include oral reading, but responding to visual and verbal prompts. Students scoring in the lowest performance level are likely in need of additional supports in reading in English. In reading in Spanish, we see approximately 21% of students across the district scoring in the top two performance levels and about a third scoring in the lowest performance level. Second grade students perform the best with over a third scoring in the top two performance levels and only 10% in the lowest performance level. First grade similarly had over a third scoring in the top two performance levels. The performance the proportion of students scoring in the top two performance levels decreased at almost every grade from second through eighth grade. Mm. Hmm. Here we have NWEA map reading performance in English by school in alphabetical order. Of the first seven schools displayed, three schools, Clark, Cook, and Greenwood, have 25% or more of their students scoring in the top two performance levels. Cook has 46% of its students starting the year in the top two performance levels. Four of the schools on this slide have more than 40% of their students scoring in the lowest performance level at the beginning of the year. The remaining schools slide shows two schools, Little Fort and McCall, with at least 25% of their students scoring in the top two performance levels, Little Fort with 33 and McCall with 29. Hyde Park has 21% of their students scoring in the top two performance levels, followed closely by Oakdale with 18 and Whittier with 17. McCall has the second lowest proportion of students scoring in the lowest performance level among all schools after Cook. Six of the eight schools on this slide have at least 44% of their students scoring in the lowest performance level at this time. Let's take a look at the middle schools. In reading in English, two schools, Smith and Lewis, have at least 20% of their students scoring in the top two performance levels this fall. Smith also has the lowest proportion of students scoring in the lowest performance level the red level. The four remaining schools have 41% or more of their students scoring in the lowest performance level and at least 14% in the top two performance levels. Now let's turn to our students' performance in reading in Spanish. Again, we have seven elementary schools in alphabetical order. Four schools, Clark, Clearview, Cook, and Glenwood, each have at least 25% of their students scoring in the top two performance levels in reading in Spanish this fall. Cook with 47%, followed by Glenwood with 30%, and Clark with 28%. All schools, with the exception of Cook, have at least 29% of their students scoring in the lowest performance level this fall. Of the remaining elementary schools, five out of the eight have at least 25% of their students scoring in the top two performance levels. Little Fort leads the way with 32%, followed closely by McCall, North, and Whittier at 26% each. Washington has the lowest proportion of students in the red area with 26%, followed by McCall, 
with 29% and four other schools with a third or fewer in that performance level. All of the middle schools had fewer than 20% of their students scoring in the top two performance levels in reading in Spanish. Benny had the lowest proportion of students scoring, scoring in the lowest performance level with 34%, while the remaining schools had 42% or more scoring in the lowest performance level. Pivoting back to reading in English, here we see reading in English performance by race, ethnicity. Three student groups, Asian, white, and two or more races, each have 25% or more of their members scoring in the top two performance levels. Asian with 38% and white with 34%. Asian and two or more races student groups each have fewer than 30% of their members scoring in the lowest performance level. Hispanic, American Indian, and African American student groups each have more than 40% of their members scoring in the lowest performance level. Reading performance highlights in English. Across the district, 19% of students scored in the top two performance levels, while 43% scored in the lowest performance level in reading in English. Clark, Cook, Greenwood, Little Fort, and McCall each have 25% or more of their students scoring in the top two performance levels. Smith and Lewis each have at least 20% of their students scoring in the top two performance levels this fall. Three student groups, Asian, white, and two or more races, each have 25% or more of their members scoring in the top two performance levels, Asian with 38% and white with 34%. Reading performance highlights in Spanish. Approximately 21% of the students across the district in K through eight scored in the top two performance levels this fall. There were about a third of students scoring in the lowest performance level. First and second grade students performed the best with over a third scoring in the top two performance levels and only 10% of second graders scoring in the lowest performance level. Nine schools, Clark, Clearview, Cook, Glenwood, Little Fort, McCall, North, Washington, and Whittier each have at least 25% of their students scoring in the top two performance levels in reading in Spanish this fall. On to our math performance. First, our students' performance in math in English. Overall across the district, approximately 18% of K-8 students tested scored in the top two performance levels. 41% scored in the lowest performance level at the beginning of this year. Kindergarten students had the highest percentage of students scoring in the top two performance bands with 35%, followed by students in grade four with 25%, and grade one with 21%. Every grade level, with the exception of kindergarten, has between 38 and 48% of the tested students scoring in the lowest performance level. These students are likely to need additional supports in math. Students in kindergarten, first, second, fourth, and seventh grades typically have math instruction in Spanish while in dual language classrooms. There are times though, when teachers have students in classrooms taught in English, they may feel that the student may show more of what they understand and can do if they test in Spanish. The eighth grade students on this slide are examples of this. We allow for that for at least two reasons. First, it is important that a teacher can accurately and efficiently gather information on student performance that can inform their instruction. Second, the goal is for students to show what they understand and can do on the spring IAR test. The math portion of IAR is available to be taken in Spanish. 
across the district, we have approximately 15% of tested students scoring in the top two performance levels in math in Spanish. Elementary grade levels have between 16 and 18% of students scoring in the top two performance levels, while middle grades have below 10% of their students scoring in the top two performance levels. This fall, the proportion of students scoring in the lowest performance level increases at each consecutive grade level. Here we see the first seven elementary schools performance in math in English. Three schools, Clark, Cook, and Greenwood, have 25% or more of their students scoring in the top two performance levels. Cook with 52% in the top two performance levels and only 10% in the lowest performance level. Four of, the se four of the first seven elementary schools have between 43 and 56 percent of students scoring in the lowest performance level this fall. The other eight elementary schools are listed here where we see two schools with 25 percent or more of their students scoring in the top two performance levels. That's Little Fort with 33 percent and McCall with 29 percent. Whittier and Hyde Park have 21 and 19 percent of their students scoring in the top two performance levels this fall. All schools on this slide, with the exception of McCall, have a third or more of their students scoring in the lowest performance level this fall. Here we have the middle school's performance where Lewis is the only school with at least 25% of their students scoring in the top two performance levels. All schools have at least a third of their students scoring in the lowest performance level this fall. On the math test presented in Spanish, we see three schools with at least 24% of their students scoring in the top two performance levels. Clark with 26%, Cook with 50% and Glenwood with 24%. Cook has the lowest proportion of students testing in the lowest performance level with only 12%, with both Glenwood and Clark having 29 and 21% in the lowest performance level. Four schools have 45% or more of their students scoring in the lowest performance level in math in Spanish this fall. The remaining eight elementary schools' students' performance in math in Spanish shows all schools with fewer than 20% of their students scoring in the top two performance levels. Washington Elementary with the highest at 18%, followed by Little Fort with 16% and Oakdale with 15%. Every school on the slide, with the exception of Washington Elementary, has at least 40% of tested students scoring in the lowest performance level in math in Spanish this fall. As we look at our middle school students' performance, we see that only four schools have students scoring in the top two performance levels. This is Benny with 13% and Smith with 11% as the most. Abbott did not have any students scoring in the top three performance levels. Four schools have over half of their students scoring in the lowest performance level in math and Spanish this fall. Here we have our students' performance in math and English by race ethnicity. The student groups of Asian, white, and two or more races have 37%, 35%, and 25% of their members scoring in the top two performance levels. Every student group has a third or fewer members, student members scoring in the lowest performance level with the exception of Hispanic with 40% and African American with 52%. Math performance highlights in English. Overall across the district, approximately 18% of students tested scored in the top two performance levels. 41% scored in the lowest performance level at the beginning of this year. Kindergarten has the highest percentage of students scoring in the top two performance levels with 35%, followed by students in grade four with 25% and grade one with 
every grade level with the exception of kindergarten has between 38 and 48 percent of students scoring in the lowest performance level. Six schools, Clark, Cook, Greenwood, Little Fort, McCall, and Lewis have 25 percent or more of their students scoring in the top two performance levels. The student groups of Asian, white, and two or more races have 37 percent, 35 percent, and 25 percent of their members scoring in the top two performance levels. Math performance highlights in Spanish. Elementary grade levels have between 16 and 18 percent of students scoring in the top two performance levels, while middle grades have below 10 percent of their students scoring in the top two performance levels. This fall, the proportion of students scoring in the lowest performance level increases at each consecutive grade level. There were three schools across the district with at least 24% of their students scoring in the top two performance levels. Those were Clark with 26%, Cook with 50%, and Glenwood with 24%. Four middle schools have over half of their students scoring in the lowest performance level in math in Spanish this fall. On to our NWEA science performance. This is the second year of administering the NWEA science test to our students as a way to provide additional information associated with student performance on the state ISA assessment. The ISA assessment is required for students in grades 5, 8, and 11. So students currently in grades 4 and 5 and 7 and 8 participate in the NWEA administration. We are starting the year with 23 and 24 percent of students scoring in the top two performance levels in grades four and five. In the middle grades, that percentage drops to 15 and 18 percent. These figures are very similar to the first administration done last year. Lastly, we will take a look at spring projections based on student performance in the fall. The projections that are provided are only for the English reading tests completed. Typically, students need to score in the 70th percentile or above to have a high likelihood of meeting standards on the spring state test. Here in reading, for students in grades 3 through 8, we see that approximately 11% are projected to meet or exceed standards on the spring IAR. Each grade level has a projection of somewhere between 9 and 12%. In math and English, the projections are smaller at this time, with about 6% across the district being projected to meet standards on the spring IAR. Most students projected to meet are from the third and fourth grades. In math and Spanish, approximately 4% of testers are projected to meet standards in the spring. These are mostly from fourth grade students. The projections provided are estimates. We will receive new estimates for students that test in the winter and then also when they test in the spring with NWEA. Good evening, Superintendent, Board President, members of the board community and colleagues. My name is Jason Nault. Uh, and to wrap up tonight's data presentation, I'll be speaking to you about Waukegan Public Schools five essential survey results for the 21-22 school year. So what is the five essential survey? The five essential survey is an evidence-based system that's been in existence for more than 22 years based on research out of the University of Chicago. The results of the surveys provide a comprehensive picture of what district and school environments look like based on five areas critical for school improvement. Who takes the five essential survey? Teachers in grades pre-K through 12 take the five essential survey, students in grades four through 12, and parents. All parents have the option to take the survey. The parent survey asks questions about the parent's overall relationship with the school. The five essential categories that are measured are the following. Ambitious instruction, 
collaborative teachers, effective leaders, involved families, and supportive environment. This next slide shows the overall district status for the 21-22 school year. As you can see, the five essential categories are listed here with a color-coded chart in terms of how the district performed in each one of these areas. So when we look at ambitious instruction, the district was strong in that area. Collaborative teachers, <coughs> weak, effective leaders, supportive environment, and involved families, neutral. When we look at our two-year change from the previous school year, you can see I have all five of the uh, essential categories listed below on the bottom. And you can see our two-year uh, comparison between uh, 2021 and 2022. As you can see, the district made improvements in the area of ambitious instruction and supportive environment. And we took some small steps backwards in the areas of effective leaders, involved families, and collaborative teachers. The next few slides will look at our response rates. This first slide is the response rates for our elementary schools. In the first column, you'll see our student response rates. In the middle column is our teacher response rates. And the last column is our parent response rates. Mm -hmm. Schools are expected to meet certain targets in order for them to receive a full comprehensive report from the University of Chicago. This slide shows some more of our middle schools. I'm sorry, elementary schools. The last of our elementary schools. And our middle school and our high school. So when we break down the survey a little further, we can look at the, the types of questions that are asked uh, for each category. So for example, under ambitious instruction, there are 24 questions and you can see how those questions are broken down. For example, there are five questions pertaining to math instruction that are answered by students. There are five questions related to English instruction that are also answered by students. Nine questions related to academic press that are answered by students and five questions related to the quality of student discussion which are answered by the teacher. So that makes up the 24 questions for the ambitious instruction category. Moving along to collaborative teachers, again there's 25 questions. All of these questions are answered by teachers, uh, but the measures are quality professional development, collaborative practices, teacher to teacher trust, collective responsibility, and school commitment. Those are the five measures that make up the collaborative teachers category. Effective leaders, again, 24 questions. These are all answered again by the teachers. There are four measures. The four measures are instructional leadership, program coherence, teacher to principal trust, and teacher influence. Involved families has 15 questions. There are three different measures that are um, responded to in this category. Parent influence on decision-making, there are five questions for that. Parent involvement in schools, four questions. Teacher to parent trust, six questions. And these are all answered um, by teachers. The last category is uh, supportive environment. And these are questions that are answered by students. There's four measures. Peer support for academic work, student to teacher trust, academic personalism, and safety. So what are the five essential ratings? Once the responses are collected for these five categories, schools in our district receive a rating. The ratings are as follows, either well-organized for school improvement, organized for school improvement, moderately organized for school improvement, partially organized for school improvement, or not yet organized for school improvement. The next slide shows you a side-by-side -side comparison of where we were in 2021 and 2022. In terms of the schools that were well-organized, we had two in 2021 and two also in 2022 for a 0% change. Organized, we went from five schools that were organized in 2021 to four that were organized in 2022 for a, a negative one delta. 
moderately organized. We went from seven schools that were moderately organized in 2021 to three schools that were moderately organized in 2022 for a, a minus four change there. Partially organized, we stayed the same. We had six in 2021, six in 2022 for a zero delta there. And not yet organized, we had two in 2021 and six in 2022 for a minus four change there. Overall, as a district, Waukegan is considered moderately organized for improvement. So all of our 22 schools, um, we have an overall district rating of moderately organized for improvement. The next couple slides will show you uh, the rating that schools received in 2021 versus the rating that they received in 2022. If they are green colored, it means that they improve their rating. If they are gray, it means they maintain their rating from the, the year before. And if they are in red, it means their rating decrease from the year before. So you'll see all of our district schools listed on the next two slides. So you can see their progress or um, digress, digression that they made uh, based on 21, 22. Here's the remainder of our schools. So to kind of summarize the overall ratings, four of our 22 schools improved their five essentials rating. Nine of our 22 schools maintained their rating from 21 and nine of our 22 schools decreased their rating uh, from the year before as well. Uh, the five essential survey is part of a school's overall asset designation as well. So it's an important piece of that puzzle. Um, the survey typically is released um, late in the year and schools, parents, teachers, uh, students, etc., cetera, uh, can respond up until, I believe it's usually March that they have the opportunity to respond. So um, we look forward to uh, implementing the survey again this year and using it to drive some of the, the district environments and the climates in our buildings. Thank you. Ms. Anna. Okay. All of these I understand that you all um, you put the numbers. Ms. Hannah, can you speak there. into the microphone? Um, I understand that you all put the um, put the uh, number of students. Okay, this still is unacceptable to me. Okay, and um, what what I don't. Uh, what I don't like is the fact that the lowest performers versus the highest performers were talked about, but none of the ones in between. And those should have been included in the ones that did not perform. So like in terms of a full ranking? Yeah, like okay, because honestly, okay, it uh, and I can, can I use your right oh, yeah. quick since you already got it up. Okay, instead, this is math. Uh, three grades, three to eight. Slide six nine. And it's not even about that. Okay, on let me just say in seventh grade. Okay, in seventh grade. We had, um, oh, and that's the projected, actually. I really wanted one that showed the performance. Okay, now I'm going to the science performance. And because, okay, all the, um, the lowest, the low average, and the average students did not meet expectations right and that was you you didn't say that i mean even though it's here visually to look at but people listening okay they don't see that okay and so we want to we want to make sure that we are narrating the correct information 
okay, okay, out to the public as well as to parents. So this was my intention at the very beginning when I described those areas, high, high average, average. Yes. That, and, and when we highlighted on one of the slides, the top two categories, that those were the top two categories that we were looking for at the very beginning of the presentation. So I tried to set the stage yeah, I, with that I, I was, in order to focus yeah. people on why I'm going through those top ones mm -hmm. and why I'm going through the bottom ones and not the middle in between. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I hope that didn't confuse. Uh, uh, no, uh, that was clear. That was yeah, clear. It was that clear was to y'all. I'm not, you, you all are not in the audience. Uh, or on on t uh, on the video watching, okay. And so, my thing is, look, w we need to make sure that we are talking yeah. about all of the students. And um, I, I'm gonna use numbers right now, okay. Um, A slide in particular. Um, let me see what where to. 60, 63, and I'm doing science performance, and I am, you got a grand total of um, 1,400, this stuff is 56. 56 that did not, that are at the lowest, okay, and then let me ask this question before I go further. Um, you are comparing this data to the national? Yes, national Why? norms. Uh, because that's the Percentile. that's a, a typical data set that would be used. We wouldn't compare them necessarily to ourselves. So we want to know where do we, to get an idea of where do we rank among all students in that particular grade level or that particular. Not, not the state? No, no, because we don't have state averages for this. This is an outside test that we purchase, so mm -hmm. they sell it across the entire United States. Okay. So they have a national data set. But it's, it's similar to when we do SAT. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not necessarily comparing to Illinois. We're comparing to, we use that national data set as well when we do that comparison. Okay, so let me, okay, thank you. Uh, let me... Um, uh, complete this uh, uh, 1,456 students uh, out of the uh, that's a grand total and for that area. Uh, of all the students for, for that red area for the red area yes. yeah and then you have 837 students and I apologize Miss Hannah can we open up the print presentation on the screens? You're talking about something that the audience, nor those on the camera, can actually visibly see. Slide 63, Mr. White. Okay, my, my whole point, Dr. Uh, Brown, is that the, the, these numbers, okay, as I said before, they're unacceptable because the yellow and the orange, including with the red, that means those are the number of students that are not achieving. I wouldn't They're describe it that way. They're approaching, the yellow part is approaching. Yes, look, look at the percentages though. So if you're in the average category, you're at the 41st to the 60th percentile. 50th percentile is about average across the board. And I was trying to make the point that if you're blessed to have kids in your classroom that are in that yellow area, those kids should be able to access that curriculum that you're giving with the teacher doing their normal uh, uh, intervention of, of uh, uh, or differentiation, differentiation uh, uh, that the teacher should be able to do that and those kids should be able to rise and succeed. And I was trying to make a distinction between them and those the kids that are especially in the red that might need additional supports where they have a, a, an additional intervention class or they have an additional 30 minutes of, of instruction. 
So I was trying to make that distinction. With, with this, the five bands that we have, there's not a cut and dry, you met standards, you didn't. Because uh, remember at the very beginning, how I said that you need to be at the 70th percentile or above to really meet standards on the IAR test at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. It's really higher than 70th, uh, but it varies between 71 and 76 or, or so, depending on the grade level. But the green category, if you see the, um, the key, the green category is high average, and that's 61 to the 80th percentile. Mm -hmm. So not everyone in green is, has that high likelihood of meeting the standards on the IAR at the end of the year. It's those that are at the 70th and above. And unfortunately, I don't have a breakdown on here for you that says, of that green category, this is how many are at between 60 and 70, and this is what percentage are between 70. We can always find that information out. But this was just to give a general idea for you to know that if I have these kids that are in the green, I still need to work with them. But they have a really high likelihood, good shot of, of being able to meet standards by the end of the year. If I have kids in the blue, I want to make sure I keep on them and, and, and uh, keep them going. Mm -hmm. If I have kids in the yellow, I got to do some more, but I really got to focus on those kids in the red. It, it's, it's to divide it up so that you would be able to take some action versus just having one blob that says 18% met and 62% uh, uh, didn't meet. You can't do a whole lot understand. with that. Okay, and so when when are these are the uh, the beginning of the year? Yes. And when when are the uh, middle of the year uh, data? When when are we going to be testing for that? Uh, typically December or January. Okay. And that's just another checkup. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Thank you. Dr. Shipley, I saw your hand. Did you put it down or you still had your question? I still have a question. Okay, so you talked about those uh, two who are blessed to have the yellow, green, and the blue. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering um, what interventions are going to be, I don't want these interventions because that's taken on a life of someone in this district. So what supports are now going to be offered to those teachers? Who have been coming to the mic routinely, this is re uh, relevant, Mr. Real, to ask for support so they can make a difference in December and January. And without using the words uh, MTSS, SEL, uh, uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> as the list goes on, I'm talking about actual supports in the academic setting and in the classroom. Okay, is I, is I won't be the one to answer that, but I do want to ask a, a clarifying uh, question. Are you specifically referring to the teachers with students in that yellow category, or are you saying teachers with students that are in in general or in where? Well, I was just piggybacking off what you said. You said those are blessed to have students in the yellow category, but all students need some type of support. Even oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, uh, um, so in either case, one, two, three, in any of the five cases, what's being offered by the district to help support those teachers so they can help to make a difference as we look toward our midterm, our midterm um, testing. Right. I won't have a line specific. We, we have to use terms like MTSS because that speaks to the interventions that students receive that are tiered depending on where they are on these exams. So that's part of our process is MTSS. Okay. So let me ask again. Yeah, okay. I'm going to answer the question. Um, I've heard Ms. Bristol and I've heard people like Mr. McIntyre talk about general education. So are we looking at, for example, having, um, using that $65 million and putting aids in the classroom that can help support reading? I've heard uh, Ms. Vukovic come up here and talk about specifics in terms of reading specialists. I'm not talking about the SEL component because we know that all students need some support um, in terms of growth. But I'm talking about when we're sitting down with books and curriculum, and ongoing training, what's in place? So, good, good evening. Um, so, there are, we, we have worked on bringing in additional tutoring so that we can do small group and individualized. Aside from that, the first question that you had asked about how, does, how we're supporting teachers, 
we've actually met with a number of teachers when I, I, I met with I meet with the union monthly we did meet with uh, some union representatives to talk about what kind of supports what kinds of supports they were they're asking for and to be very specific with what that is and so we've worked with that a group of um, union representatives liaisons uh, to talk about the types of supports that we could provide and so some of that was professional development on co-teaching some of it was about trauma-informed uh, instruction what we could do to assist with that and so we were we sat down we listened we've already implemented I know I, I believe this past week uh, Miss Gillen gave um, a professional development um, on I can't remember the topic I believe it was co-teaching but I, I, I don't quote me on that but so we we've, we've already started this process of engaging and listening and trying to provide those supports Agreed. And Ms. Gillian, Agreed. she's come up here and she talked about the teachers need the support. So if it's ongoing, even with co-teaching, there has to be some type of regimen. I can't just go in and just talk about us co-teaching and, and co-existing in the classroom. There has to be a skill set. There has to be sequencing. There has to be processing. Agreed. So where, where, where is that? I'm not saying so, that we can get into it tonight. No. Is that gonna, uh, are you going to have that conversation with the meeting that you want to set up? With Mr. McIntyre? You asked about professional development opportunities. So these are some that we're doing. We have ongoing ones that were part of a plan that we've had existing for, for su supporting some of the ongoing programs that we have. And then what came up were additional concerns regarding how, how we can support. And so that's what we've been doing is we've been listening to, to what those requests were to, to assist in the classroom. And you're absolutely right. You can't just do a one and done. It's got to be continual. We have, it has to be ongoing and it has to be differentiated for the teachers too, because we don't want to give something to them that they already have or that they don't want. So that was part of the reason why we said we don't want to do a, um, a one size fits all, if you will, but rather tell us what you need. And I gave, I was just using the co-teaching as one example of what was needed. All right, there, there were several examples given off the top of my head. Uh, I, I don't remember all of them, but there were several and we're engaging in this conversation because it's ongoing about what, we're, what we need. I know people don't want to hear about the pandemic, but because of it, there are other things that we're, we're, we're uh, addressing. And then as students are coming to school that haven't been socialized. And that, that takes some professional development too. And that's one of the things that we heard about. Um, so it's, it's an ongoing issue that we're, we're relating to. Is it perfect? It's not perfect. And that's why we want to address the concerns because we want to retain our teachers and we value what they're doing. Um, Principal? Is it with the area superintendent? Is it with your office? Or, you know, so, just look and see what's going on, for example. At I can. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Please. In terms of those supports for the classroom and for the teachers, so they can address these scores, so and the problems that exist, you know, and uh, for our next testing cycle. Where is that? At? So we do have a uh, a menu of professional development opportunities that we had mapped out over the course of the year, as I said previously, to align to existing work that we're doing. And then some of the things that I just previously spoke to, those are things that we're developing right now. And so that's ongoing because we're having continual meetings with them. That's why I asked Amanda to come up to uh, Amanda, myself, um, Dr. Bublitz, uh, Jennifer Rice de Sanchez, the director of teaching and learning has also been part of that conversation. So it's an ongoing conversation. We don't have an exhaustive list of that, but we do have the PD opportunities and we have that mapped out uh, through, through the uh, end of this year right now. Um, but we're also taking feedback because part of what we're doing is surveying them after these opportunities uh, to find out what we can do better. Ms. Vukovic. Okay. And I'm, Mr. Alajakis is bringing the mic. So I think listening to what you have in place or that you're working on, which first of all kind of shocks me, it's October, it's almost November. How are we not already having some of these things in place? 
didn't you just say that we're working on that no we we do have the we do have the pd in place i said we had mapped that out from okay. the beginning of last year what what um i was mentioning to dr shipley was something that she had addressed about the needs that teachers had brought up and what i had said is that we've met with them i meet with the i'm sorry let me speak into the mic mm -hmm. so everybody can hear me so i i meet with the union monthly and some of the things that they brought up and some of the things that miss gillen had had mentioned at this very podium were things that we wanted to sit down and talk to them about mm -hmm. because we didn't want to do a one-size-fits-all right and so we wanted to address what the needs and concerns were that is an uh, that is not exhaustive as i said and that is something that we're, we're building out right now that is true the other piece what we've already started working on in terms of anything that we you had heard about the high school transformation plan anything associated with that we had that professional development mapped out we had professional development mapped out for some of the curriculum that we're, we're implementing. We had it mapped out for, for, for uh, co-teaching. So again, I, I can go down the list, but we already have that mapped out. I can show that. There's th full transparency. You're absolutely right. It would be shocking if we, if we were just planning as we go. We're not doing that. Again, just to be fully transparent, being responsive to what has currently been brought up, we, we want to meet with, with those teachers, and we have been meeting with them, and to design uh, things to meet the immediate needs that are being presented mm -hmm. right now. Again, as I brought up, we have students that are coming that have not been socialized, uh, that have some of them ha had, had only interacted with their parents or their immediate family, mm -hmm. not with any other students, and it presents unique, unique course, yes. concerns and issues, right? Um, and so we want to address the things that are brought, being brought up to us. Mm -hmm. and, and it's ongoing. It's not, we haven't stopped doing that. But that is stuff that we're, we're planning right now. Right. Because we want to be responsive. My concern is who, who I mean, I you said you're meeting with teachers and Sorry, union mm -hmm. people. Um, at this point, I mean, it is the end of October now. So you've got November and then the middle of the year testing happens. The teachers need hands-on, I mean, professional development is wonderful. Sure. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I've had it, I've, it's helped me learn a lot about my teaching. Right now, they need people, when you look at this, these scores, it is shocking to me that two or three weeks ago, you were just asking the board to hire a tutoring company that you didn't like the one from last year and I sat here last year and said you don't need another online program you need a human being sitting in front of the child to help diagnose what the problem is and zero in on what their problem is and work on that so that's my biggest concern my second concern is very related to this there are three board members up here that voted to get rid of the reading specialist program i know you weren't here but some people were um got rid of the reading specialist program five years ago five six years ago maybe and that program some people said that it didn't work the program they were using wasn't working or the text they were using wasn't working but why are the board and those of you that are new on here or newer on here why have you not the, these scores have been going down i know there'll be an argument that yes they've been going up and they've been but the reality is what miss hannah was talking about they're not good pandemic aside i understand that has a lot to do with a lot of the red i'm not denying that or anything but we need reading specialists to come back and what you've done is you've hired a company that's going to hire tutors who don't have to have from what was said last week or two weeks ago they don't have to have a degree the, the reading specialists when I was there we had to have a reading not only a bachelor's degree we had to have a reading endorsement or we weren't allowed to stay in that position because the reading specialist, when you get trained for that, you learn how to diagnose problems. When I was with my, at my previous school, we had a pattern that we set up every year, and there were three reading specialists because there were 700 kids at our school, 
and there were 150 kids serviced every single day with three reading specialists. That's how many kids, that's all the kids that were below or very below. You would need 10 at every school to try to fix this problem. Somewhere along the line, we need help for the teachers and time for them to have time to go to a professional development at this point, no. They have, you've got them doing curriculum mapping and curriculum writing. Let them teach and give them more bodies in the room or pull out whatever program will, you can do. And that's what this pandemic money should have been spent on. But now we lost all of last year and everybody, teachers all said that it was no good, the whatever one you had before this. And hey, tutor, I don't know much about it, but it's also people that are not trained like the reading specialists were. So to have somebody come in and, oh, I'm going to tutor these kids and I'm going to sit there without having the training of, what's this child's problem? Oh, he doesn't, his fluency is a problem, or phonics, or decoding, or phonemic awareness. There's all of these different things that a reading specialist would be able to figure out and then target. We would have three reading specialists. We took the month of September. Nobody here knew that's what we were doing, but our principal wanted us to. And we did diagnostic testing on all of the kids that were below the 25th percentile. And at that point, then we divided by according to what they were, where their problem appeared or where their issue appeared, each of us would take a different group of kids that fit into that. It wasn't just everybody below the 10th percentile. Well, they could have four or five different issues among those five or six students that you're trying to put into one group instead of putting them along with the others. I know it seems like people come here and complain and it's like, let's please do, give us some solutions. Here's a solution. Bring the reading specialist program back with qualified people. And I know it costs a lot of money, but you've lost a year and now there's no teachers because the ones that were cut from the reading program either left the district or went to a different school or went back into the classroom. So now, because of the pandemic, there's no teachers to be had. So you created a bigger problem, not you, five years ago, six years ago, by cutting that program and losing these valuable people who have the training to be able to zero in on the problem the child has and maybe, you know, some of them, it, they're, in it, they're in the program for six years five or six years. But the kids that are in sixth and seventh grade right now that the scores are so low, those children went from kindergarten through fifth grade with no reading help except for maybe one person at a school who was supposed to do reading and math. That's what ended up at our school was one instructional coach because they changed the name, or instructional support. And they're supposed to do reading and math with 100, 150 kids, impossible. So that's a solution that, get, forget that other program, I'm sure you've already signed a contract with it, but you need trained people at this point. It is an emergency now, from what those scores said, it's an emergency, forget professional development, forget curriculum mapping, let the teachers teach and give them some other people that can help them reach the children that are struggling. I, 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 I appreciate the, I'm passionate about it because oh, it is. I know. I know. I, I've sat here year after year after year, and I speak up and I say, "So, oh, we're working on that. Well, we're looking into this. We're looking into that." And in the meantime, the scores are now. I have down here because I analyzed the ones that Mr. Riddle was asking how to make it more user friendly, or at least right. what we have. There are three schools in the district: Carmen, Clearview, and Washington Elementary that are the, they have the three, the least number of students in average, above average, or uh, what's the blue one? High average. Yeah. They have the least number, but when, and Dr. Brown, I, no fault to you because you weren't here last, the last time <coughs> when they were giving the presentation, that someone in the audience had made a suggestion because it said it was kind of like your gaslighting and it wasn't you, but that you're telling only the, uh, something similar to what Ms. Hannah said, you're only telling, oh, well, so many of the upper people and not mentioned the number of students that were low. Now, some of your text at the end of your thing did, did show that. Um, so those three schools 
One has 17% of the students are meeting or exceeding. The other one, it was 29%, and the other one was 30%. And yet, when you were giving the data, it, leaving out the orange and the yellow, it looked like some of those schools were doing better than they are. But this is the bottom line. This is what they were doing. I've sat and done the math. I've added it up. I've done all of them. I have all the schools down here. I took the, I took, nope, I took the yellow, the average, above average, and way above average as, right. as the kids that are meeting. So I gave, that was a benefit because you said they're not all in the 50th percentile. And then I took the orange and the red and put those together, together and that's, that's the ones right. that are below. Pardon me? Put I put it into two categories, exactly. Yeah. And so that, no way. we've worked with data all the time. And you know, because I've had to reach out to you lots of times when I went back in the classroom, but uh, it, it, it's so frustrating for me to sit here and say, well, we're doing professional development. Oh, we're, we're working on this, working on that. Give the teachers the time to teach, forget pulling them out for training, get them some physical trained reading teachers to come and that's the only way that this is going to turn around the only way is because the kids in a class of 28 the teacher cannot address every single child especially the ones below the 10th percentile absolutely impossible and it's i I've, year after year after year i hear these reports and i'm just is nobody up here listening, the seven of you, that the, this is terrible and it's continuing. Yes, it is. It's continuing. And yet, three of you voted to get rid of the program and the rest of you have let it go on without being brought back, even though I've asked multiple times for it to be brought back. And I have no skin in the game. I'm retired. I'm not coming back. But there are things that can be done and we need to support the classroom <coughs> teachers because how are they going to have a student that that's in that that many in the red and then two or three in the blue what about right. those blue kids that's right what's happening to them they're not going to be able to be brought you know we, we said we have to keep them up because they're they're the ones we need to help make the data look better so Thank you, Ms. Bukovic. I had a couple of hands. I saw Ms. Wozniak, and then I'll come back over to Dr. Shipley. Um, I have um, a couple of questions. Uh, page 24 of the, of the slides. slides. Can you go to that one, Lee? It shows that, um, page 24, it shows that um, the second grade, we only had 10% and then 30 35 percent in the low and um, low average and then it, it seems to fall apart <laughs> after that um, why what 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 is happening in second grade that we they're achieving and then third grade they're falling apart in fourth grade keep, keep in mind that this is these are all the kids that are here this year this is not mm -hmm. like second grade and then how right. they went on to the Right. Next grade level. But how did we make, how did the second graders do so well? And that's a, I don't know, that's a good question. I, I mean, I, I can't tell you what's specifically <laughs> happening in the classroom right. to say this is what's going on for second grade. Okay. And then, so then we go look at page um, 56. And if you look at Abbott, they have nobody at all in the blue or the green. What's going that, on there? That was surprising, but this is also uh, Spanish. So for them, it should be only seventh graders at their, uh, in their building. Right, there's only 49 of them, yeah. but I got I, I would think out of 49 students, right. one of them right. is high average or average. Well, I mean, we're not even at average. Um, it, and I what's want going to, on? too, for context, right? Uh, this is the beginning. When do they take this test? Like, we, how many weeks are they in school when they take this test? Uh, it depends on when the school uh, schedules it, but it starts in August and runs through September. But yep. the, other, the other schools managed to get one. <laughs> 
it, it, you know? I mean, it's one of those questions where we have to go back and look at those particular students, that particular class, find out uh, more about what the teacher would say about that particular class. Uh, because I, from above, I can't really say mm -hmm. this is what happened with that group in well, that classroom. We need to look into at what's going on at Abbott. And, um, Right. Oh, I know. Well, that's this is math. This is math. So, um, and then uh, five essentials. Where is AOEC on the five essentials? Are they lumped in with the high school? Yeah, the, the high school gets one report all together. Okay. All Just, the and the only thing I didn't see on that five essential survey was the total number of people that took the five essential survey. How many, how many people took that survey? They just give us participation percentages. They don't give us the numbers by school. overall. They just give us participation percentages for each school. Really? Yep. Hmm. So if a parent has a student in school A, uh, they, they get the email to take the survey for that particular school. No, I get it, but uh, usually there's numbers um, of total people that uh, took the uh, survey. I have never seen numbers, and I've been reporting this data my pretty much my whole career. And I've never seen number really? overall numbers, just participation percentages by school. Because I think Nick gave us numbers before. Those are in district tests. If you want to confirm that, and maybe come back, <laughs> Doctor Note. But I think what Miss Hannah said, typically Nick can see the response rates, and so he has a total number of those who took the test. And so what Miss Hannah is saying. And, and if you don't have the answer or you say no, but just confirm that we don't have the total number of District 60, you know, staff members. We have percentages, but do we have the total staff number? But th th this the data is pre prepped by University of Chicago? Yeah. Well, yeah. So it, we don't have access to those numbers. They give us a comprehensive report as a district, and uh, they only give us participation percentages. They don't give us raw numbers. No, I was giving you the difference between Nick, but I agree if Dr. Nock can try and see if he can find that out, I, I would want him to give you the information that you're requesting. I can email him and ask if they have it. Yeah. But keep in mind, we have parents across multiple schools, too. So you may have a student at Abbott, you may have a school in the high school, you may have a school right, in elementary, it, it, you know what I mean? So Right, I understand yeah. the, um, the distinction and stuff, but there should be a grand total number of the people that took that five essential survey. Because okay. I've always found that it was not truly representative of um, uh, of the um, the staff, the parents, the students, so on and so forth. Thank you, Ms. Hedda. So go on to Dr. Shipley, and then I'm coming to you, Mr. Riddle. Okay. Um, since okay. the pandemic, research have sh has shown, Dr. Nault, that one of the biggest ways to address SEL when it relates to black students or students who have been traumatized or students who come from um, struggling communities or circumstances that um, um, leave much to be desired it, when it comes to schooling is positive academic achievement. So when we're looking at all of these things outside of the classroom, maybe we should focus in what can be done in the classroom because we have learned, and Ms. Briscoe has talked about this, if you have a student who is in dire circumstances outside of school, when he comes to school and he's successful, that's what he's there for. That's his relief from his environment and circumstances. So I don't necessarily need a baseball team or somebody driving in to you know, uh, tutor me. Maybe if I'm in school with someone who's supporting me in my class and I'm getting a passing grade, you won't need all of these SEL circumstances. So that should be one of the interventions. The intervention should be positive academic achievement and whatever Absolutely. it takes to support that in the classroom. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Shipley. Uh, Mr. Riddle. Very good point, Dr. Shipley, very good point. Um, I, I just have a couple questions. One would be, we give these tests three times a year. Um, how do these, how does this year's fall test compare with previous years and maybe not necessarily 
during the pandemic, but prior to the pandemic. That would be my first question. And then my second question would be, I've got a couple questions. The second question would be, how do principals and teachers look at, this, at these results and, and what do they, are they alarmed about or how does this inform them to adjust their teaching or get extra tutoring for su certain students? How does, how does this test actually used? What should the board be concerned about from what we see here? We see a lot of variety among different schools I'm giving you quite a few questions. Maybe you want to answer the first one first. How does this well, compare? Well, I can with, say uh, uh, I got about for sure. I, I cannot tell you how directly how it compares to previous years, because once we've had the pandemic and we started in 2019 to do that reset. Yes. It's been. This is where we are, and we're looking forward. Um, but I can tell you that uh, uh, also our focus has been more on end of year what's happening at the uh that's what I would say about that um, as far as what should you be looking at right. there's a variety of things here that I, I don't want to say what you should be looking at uh, what I think is important <laughs> Right. is what I tried to highlight in the uh, videos, that we are looking at a, a, uh, a range of student uh, um, uh, performances uh, within, a, dis or within a, a grade level and then breaking it down to within a classroom. Right. And it's always, okay, if my students are in this particular, we need a way to be able to categorize what's happening so that I can then decide what to do about it. And uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Vukovic gave a, a great example. It's, it's not about just the 10th percentile. Mm -hmm. It's about what about the 10th percentile and what do those particular kids need? Because when you break it down to these individual categories, even these groups still need different yes. things. So it's, I would not, at your level, look at it in that type of detail. I would look at it in terms of these particular categories and uh, uh, in how that, uh, that can be applied to where we want to go in terms of the uh, uh, final state assessment or where we want to go in terms of what this says that our kids are likely to be able to do going forward. So for example, I, I, when I highlight the blue and the green. Right is to prevent, and, and the reason I don't bring the uh, yellow in, is because we've had a couple years where we've had all three of those, and a teacher will say in their classroom, oh wow, I've got 35% uh, of my kids you know, hitting this uh, target. And then at the end of the year for the state assessment, well hold on a second, why do I only have 10% or 15% of my kids? When this told me, it's because of those different, uh, um, what the what the scores the scores mean something different. So for this is why I try to uh, uh, stress on the NWEA if we're going to make that comparison, we've got to look at kids that are at 70 and above. When a teacher looks at that, when you look at that, when I try to highlight the green and the uh, blue, that at least makes it more comparable to what you're going to see or likely see at the end of the year. You don't see this big change and say, well, hold on a second, what's going on? Then on the other end, we always want to know who are the kids that absolutely need help. And part of it is to help us see who those kids are. And that's why I highlight the red portion of it, because we know likely if a student is taking the test seriously and they're doing their absolute best and they fall in that red category, they likely do need some type of additional help. And that directly allows the school, the teacher, the district to, at a, a, a large grain size, figure out where some resources might need to go. But then for, at the uh, classroom level, the teacher for this particular test, and some other tests are similar, yeah. it's how much additional information are you going to give me besides just a score for a student? What does that score mean to me about, uh, or what does it mean to student A uh, in terms of what that student can do. 
And so we're able to drill down a little bit more with this particular test, and uh, other tests are uh, similar, uh, to where it would be able to tell us that if you're scoring in this particular range, these are the likely skills that you're able to do, uh, skills that you, that you uh, uh, need work on, skills that you likely have uh, mastered. So mm -hmm. it'll give you an idea of that. Now it's an estimate. Right. It, it, it just gives you a sense of what's there. The absolute best thing is what's happening in the classroom and when the teacher is interacting with the student and asking questions and, and having uh, assessments that are directly tied to what we just taught in that unit. And right. that's part of what the curriculum mapping and the uh, unit assessments uh, there are, are doing. Right. But this is to, to give that global sense to keep your, 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 your eyes open to see in general what's happening uh, uh, before it's too late. Right. And, and the other thing, I, another question I have is that, I mean, I've read that kids, you know, in a ch more challenged areas like urban areas like Waukegan versus kids who have a lot of resources at home and, and those kids, the gap has got bigger. So in school districts where there's, those kids are, the blue, for instance, is much larger. They haven't had learning loss, but kids in, in areas like ours have had. So I, I would think possibly this red has got bigger for us, not faulting our teachers or whatever, just because of what happened you know, during the pandemic. And like you said, we can't constantly blame the pandemic, but it's a picture of who we have in our district and who we, and now we have to build resources as our, you know, our public is saying for those kids both the ones that are near the top or getting close, as you said, the green and the yellow, but also, so thinking of both ends of the spectrum and working on it. My other question, I guess, was um, um, we're going to test again. Uh, so, so and, and we do t a lot of testing. Um, I, and I guess I just want to make sure that this is, you know, valuable to us and that we understand as a board what it's for, and the public does too, that it isn't to put the finger on certain teachers or district administrators for you know saying we're doing a terrible job look what's happened you know here we've got so much red you know so many kids in this red i, I don't know if you could right. talk about that a little bit you know this is it, it, is it, it's to assess what what we have to deal with right and the issues that we have in our in our school system and and how we can deal with it and not to point the finger at anybody right, or say right. we're doing a terrible job with education in Waukegan in any assessment results can be misused yes. and, and uh, changed to, uh, to be used for your own purposes. But that's not the purpose behind this. It, that's not the purpose behind this. this. This has always been about, if we don't do this, we don't know, uh, there's no way to communicate to you all, to the public as a whole, how we are uh, doing. We would have to wait until the end of the year for uh, IAR every single time in order for us to have any idea of what is going on. Uh, again, like I said before, it's useful in the classroom where a teacher can actually uh, figure out what a student is, is able to do and, and get some insight into how they might inform their instruction. But uh, uh, quite honestly, we're, we're trying to build our assessment system to where we're relying more so on the curriculum-based assessments, that we know that uh, if a teacher is teaching unit one on this particular uh, topic and they're expected to master these standards by the end of that unit or so, that we have a measure of that particular unit and those standards at that point in time so that we can know for sure versus a global uh, uh, test that might cover a couple of those standards, might not cover a couple of those standards, yeah, it gives us a good idea in math and reading of where we are, but we want to know specifically because then the teacher can act on that and know that 10% uh, uh, of my class just did not get what I wanted them to get for this unit. And I can do my intervention like the bridging uh, uh, um, time periods that they've uh, established between uh, units. Right. But that's what it's about. We, we want to be able to build a system that is reliable in that regard and still gives us confidence that at the end of the year, if our students master these standards as shown on these particular assessments, then we can have high confidence that on the IAR, they're gonna do well, or on the SAT, they're gonna do well. And right. then we don't have to have 
a measure like NWEA. Right. Um, right. I know we have questions. I still see audience questions. I'm going to do uh, a couple things. If we can ask our question and then if we can respond to that directly, if there's something that's a takeaway that you want them to come back with information, I'm going to ask that you give it. And Dr. Nault, if you can just take the question and we'll make sure that it's brought back up at a, not right now, but a coming, but I, I had Ms. Leguizamo, I saw Ms. Briscoe, I had a quick statement and then I did see Ms. Uh, Gonzalez and I want to make sure I give Mr. Riddle the opportunity. I do want to say this nine on one and if I'm not mistaken, we still have, I see Ms. Polk out there. So yes, we do. that means that we did not do uh, operations. the operations while oh, you were I'm waiting. Sorry. So with that, uh, Mr. Riddle, are there any other questions that you? Only a final comment. I thank you for this. I just, I, I believe it's important. These assessments are important, but we also have to remember what takes place in the classroom and you mentioned that you know we're 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 all about education we're, we're teaching kids it's the everyday stuff the enthusiasm i see in my grandkids about going to school every day and learning so you know we don't want to get depressed and 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 tell everybody that we're all in the red you know we've got 50 or 60 percent of our public i mean our public school kids in waukegan who are doing terrible i don't like to hear that I, because there's a lot of great things going on in the classrooms. When I visit the classrooms, I see kids excited about learning. So yes, this is a measure, it's something to use, it's a tool, but I think it's important to realize education is exciting, it, uh, we're, we're, it's a lifelong process, and our kids go to school every day with the, with, for a lot of reasons, to socialize, to see their teachers, they get excited about their teachers, uh, they get excited about learning. So, you know, this is a part of it, but it's not, the whole bit of what takes place every day in the classroom and that interaction between students and teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Riddle. Ms. Leguizamo? All right. Uh, I've been trying to summarize these things here. So uh, two takeaways for you. Um, on the reporting, when it talks about they take the, the tests in English and in Spanish, right? What it doesn't do is that it doesn't break out the classroom types. Is it a monolingual class that is taking the test in English, or is it a dual language, one-way class that's taking the test in English, or taking the test in Spanish, right? right? Or you know, so or the bilingual class is taking it in Spanish and or English, right? Because once again, these teachers and or students have the option to take either or, and as we're looking at the data, right? we're seeing it from like English test takers, Spanish test takers, but we're not looking at the classroom's types. And the classroom types, I think, it, it depends on the deliverance, and, and that's where, where my train of thought was thinking as to why I'd like to see that type of breakout. Um, that's a takeaway. This is, just to help you a little bit with that, this is what I try to do with this. Um, for math, for example, mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning we said that the bilingual department lets us know which they let us know which classrooms. I shouldn't say literally which classrooms, but for for example, dual language in third grade is if for math is supposed to be taught in Spanish. I might be wrong about that, uh, or dual language in third grade, second grade, and seventh grade needs to be taught in Spanish uh, for math. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind they take the test in Spanish, and then that's why we report it that way. So we rely on, on uh, we put together a chart that basically says, uh, this is what instruction is supposed to be, so therefore this is why we test it that way. Right. Um, and the results, that's why they're always separated that way. Uh, so it's, it's, it is a safe assumption mm -hmm. to, uh, to say that dual language kids that are receiving instruction in Spanish are testing in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Now you will see on the flip side for reading, uh, we say that starting in third grade and up, even though the instruction might be, the percentages uh, vary for uh, um, instruction in Spanish, because the state test is in English mm -hmm. starting in third grade, right. we would kind of do a disservice to not expose them to some practice during the year in, in did I say in Spanish? In, in, in English. English. We got you. Uh, <laughs> I'm yeah. following. Um, I thought that sounded weird. Um, <laughs> to not give them some practice in a formalized uh, assessment in English. So that's why they may take it in both. So that's why those numbers, as I mentioned before, mm -hmm. don't add up to the total sum of what we have. It's, it's over. It's because they've taken it in, in both. 
Right, right. And, and I think that just kind of understanding what that looks like, because when um, I, I'll just keep that as, as a takeaway, and then I'll, I'll move on to the, the second one, right? The other second takeaway is that um, these reports still do not include what our benchmarks are, what we are looking to accomplish, what end goal, um, less percentage of less performing students, right? What What is our line of defense that we have established at our school district, not nationwide, right? What, are, what did we d d communicate out to the principals so that they can also focus and have that end goal in mind? And I'm not seeing that in any of the reports. That's another takeaway, another uh, something for you guys to think about, right? Because I think that we need to have that end goal to communicate out to every single principal. Um, there was a discussion around, um, and this is for Dr. Cesario, mm -hmm. so uh, I'm gonna point, point to you on this one. The discussion that you've been having in regards to what kind of academic supports that um, are going to occur or are currently happening in our school district, you mentioned that um, you are having these conversations with the union team and talking with them about those specific classroom supports that they're looking for, right? My question is, why aren't those conversations happening from a principal level that manages the SBB funding? Because there are some principals out there that use SBB funding for reading intervention specialist positions or other different types of things depending on what it is that they identified as the needs of their building, right? So I'd like to understand, is, is that happening, not happening? Is there a disconnect or is it more high level? So just trying to understand. I, I just want to let you, I mean, yeah. I, I, there's a formal structure where I meet with them. It's not informal. I'm not just meeting with them and, so, you know, they're, it's a, um, I have a monthly meeting with the liaisons to discuss issues that are brought to them. Mm -hmm. And so this this has been an issue that has been brought up to them. It's been something that has been discussed here. Okay. Um, I do, you know, that I, I think the principals are in their, they're, they're working with their teachers, they're soliciting. Um, I, I don't know what other information is coming down mm -hmm. that way. What I was referencing is how I'm interacting sure. with that information that's coming in through that structure that I have. And so one of the things I do when I get that information is there's a spreadsheet that's created and then we try to be very collaborative about solving this. Some things are solved pretty quickly, some things are ongoing, um, and this is one that, that kept going, but I, as I said to Dr. Shipley, wanted to make sure that we were differentiating and not just having PD opportunities have PD opportunities. Let's sit down, if you, and I asked if they could, could get specific feedback from their membership mm -hmm. so that we c it could be targeted supports. And that, that's some of what we're, that, that's how I, that's how I went about addressing that issue. And, and what you're just saying just also kind of clicks, and this is for us board members, remember as we're looking through that budget sheet that talks about what full-time employees that our principals are requesting under the SBB funds, that's why that's important because maybe those positions um, were not funded or were not um, approved to to have and we need to take a look at what that looks like right so just kind of making that holistic and, and piecing all that together for us um, and, and that could probably be the lack of right where the principal probably did put in the request but maybe something didn't happen or you know so that's why I wanted to just bring up that that conversation so it's just a recommendation uh, another thing that I wanted to recommend, thank you, Dr. Cesario. Sure. Um, so, Superintendent, uh, this right here would be a little bit for you and Dr. Nolt. At one of the, the past uh, conferences we went to for ALAS, there was a school, Hartford, mm -hmm. um, Hartford School. They talked about a summer school program slash even a uh, like spring break program where what they did was they had the creme of the creme teachers apply for a specific program and those programs is pretty much a school day but has those in school day reading interventions and learning environment. They use the ESSER funds to fund and give them an additional monies because this is 
out of their their normal schedule that they got paid a little bit more than what a normal other teacher would normally get paid. It is at a higher pay scale, and it is going to be a heavy intervention. Now, those are those teachers that we know that are in our school districts that have those gains um, and have those proven gains. Like, you know that if, if they're in their class, those students will, you know, ex succeed, you know, over by a, a great percentage, right? So it's a, a very targeted specific summer school slash spring spring break um, we know some of our teachers go out and get a second job instead of them getting a second job they can continue to do what they love to do and do it in the classwork and then get paid a really good amount uh, to, to do it and to be a part of that program so it's it's another thing to think about as we're talking about those kinds of things and Rounding it out with five essentials. Um, let's see. I, I, I'd like to understand, and I don't know if you can figure this out or not, if the, the lack of parent participation is because for each of those school buildings is because of the lack of either A, PTO, or B, face liaison engagement. I think there's a number of factors that probably come, come into play. Um, Different schools do different things. A lot of schools run incentives for, to try to get parents to complete the surveys. Um, they try to hook parents in for different events and activities, and when they do bring them in, they, they give them opportunities to do their surveys there as well. Uh, I know as a district, we're trying to improve our parent participation overall in every school. Uh, ideally, we would like to see 20% minimum in every single building, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the threshold that ISB, uh, not ISB, uh, University of Chicago typically requires for the schools to get a comprehensive report similar to what we do at the district level. Mm -hmm. um, so continuing continuing to push our principals to increase that <coughs> parent participation is, is, is important. Right, because uh, I, I do know in some prints in some buildings, like the face liaison um, engagement is 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 on it's it's on point, it's on target in some areas there's also a lack of, and I was wondering if there was a correlation between the two that'll help out with the five essentials. And I just wanted to make sure if you can just remind me, is the five essentials included in the SIP? It is. Yeah. It's School part of Improvement their, Plan yeah, SIP part for of those. The, it's, it's calculated into the ESSA designation that they, that they get as well. Mm -hmm. um, but Ms. Gonzalez was actually speaking about this last night at the workshop about the effectiveness of our PTOs and how that varies from building to building. And I think you'll probably see the schools that have a, a highly effective PTO probably have more higher participation rates on those surveys than, than schools that, that don't. Mm -hmm. So it's something that we're continuing to try to refine and, and build on in, in all our schools with, the, with FACE. Appreciate that. Board President, that's how I summarized it. Ms. Uh, Briscoe. First, I want to say that I do appreciate the data. Um, it was very, very spot on. I think for me, though, it's over time and knowing where the district has been, it's not really a surprise of what we see, right? Because we know that it's always mentioned that because of the pandemic and the pandemic has um, made a difference as far as our students and their academic performance. I think that because we've known that for a while, I wanna piggyback on what Lucy's saying up there. It's like, have we checked with other districts who are in similar situations to find out what are they doing? It just seems to me if you're continuing to go to teachers to ask teachers for suggestions on what to do, we are constantly falling behind the eight ball. Why not go and check with other districts to see what's successful for them? And it's like we're a year behind. And we could have maybe been implementing what other districts have been doing um, ahead of time. And now we're at a point where we could see what have they been doing and what's been successful and try implementing those things now before we lose more students with this data because the data says that our students right now are not faring too good. Just a suggestion. Um, the other thing too, I was also curious about the parent uh, survey for the five points. Those numbers are really, really low. It just seems like um, more accountability should be done um, at the school level to ensure that we get the parents, um, uh, you know, whatever it is that they have to say because I believe that it's gonna take the parents that are gonna make a difference. And without their support, I don't think that our grades are gonna go up too much or whatever. So I think that whatever you guys can do to bring that, uh, those numbers up for the parents, 
that I think will help the district as a whole. Last question is that, um, do we know for, for this information, like how many students are included in, in this data? Do we know how many students we have enrolled right now? And that, that's my last question. I don't know the total enrollment right now. 14,000. Well, what? this is only uh, K through eight. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought it was about 8,000 or so, but that's why we put together the print version that would have the specific totals in there for questions like that, because I, I didn't remember it off the top of my head. Ms. Prisco, we'll <clears throat> get you that exact number, though. Jason, can you please email that to her? Yep. And it's in the, it's on the print version, right? But the, so count, the counts are on the, the attachment on the board docs. You can see the counts for each grade level that took the exam. They're on there. We, uh, we, we average, like I think, around 1,100 kids per grade level, usually-ish, 1,000 kids per grade level. Historically, we have, anyway. Yeah, but we're... Yeah, I mean, we continue to <laughs> decrease, but yeah. Right. We used to... Ms. Gonzalez? I emailed my questions, but they were related to some of the things that were recently brought up. Um, my question was if there's any way to relate the, um, the low, low performance bands to maybe the students who are experiencing um, a, a large amount of substitute teaching or whether there's specific vacancies that we have yet to fill or that are filled with other things that might have impacted those students. You don't have to answer now, I emailed it. Um, and and uh, I noticed that some of the schools have lower staff participation in the five essentials plan. So I, I, you know, I know that they're included in the SIP planning, so what, what can we do even from the staff side to increase the participation? And um, I talked uh, to Dr. Note yesterday and I mentioned whether there could be incentives even for students like to get pride points if they engage their parents at home or their guardians and, and say, hey, mom, dad, whoever, grandma, grandpa, can you fill out the survey so that they could get the points at school? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, yeah. and I emailed that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So I think my statement is uh, somewhat in line, is, is not about being retrospective. Uh, it's what are we explicitly doing to accelerate growth, right? And I think that's what you hear from the audiences when I asked, where we were at is this was a snapshot I've heard the stories and I see exactly hey we have some students that have socialization issues we see the numbers we know where they are um, these numbers don't tell the full story but they do to uh, Dr. Brown's point give us a pinpoint of where we need to intervene and so instead of just explicit and I think what 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 I would encourage the board to ask and the staff to reflect, right? We, we have the new tutoring program, I think that's great. What other supports do we need to put in place? And because we will have that middle of year data, and that's my fear. My fear is that the goalpost has now moved, <laughs> as, as Dr. Brown has explained to me. And so now when we see those numbers, it's, it's, that's my concern. So just explicitly, not tonight, if we have a list, because again, going back to my same example when we were having the other conversation, is when the community says, hey, what are we doing to address this? We're doing A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. So that is, is my takeaway. Um, and <laughs> just one, just one, just one. Uh, <laughs> I promise. But, and, okay, let me finish. Um, and then communicating scores to parents. As a parent in the district, as someone who sees these numbers, as someone who knows these numbers, I'll use the hypothetical, has a kid who is in one of the highest percentiles, but because of how the report was, he didn't grow from where he was last fall to where he was, I mean last uh, spring <coughs> to where he was this fall. Doesn't the report show that in a little printout that they give? It will is he was still in the highest percentile, but because he didn't grow, you know, little man was about to get in trouble with his mom, and <laughs> but not, and I'm like, no, no, no. He's higher than where he needs to be, which is good. He just didn't grow at the expected rate, and I don't think a lot of parents know what the numbers mean, and they see them, and how are we communicating um, that to, to parents? And for fall, you usually see a slight drop from spring to, yeah, we don't want that kind of thing to happen. <laughs> but no, um, I miss, you said quick question and yeah. then I see Ms. Okay, quick, quick, quick comment. I think that the board, 
I think I think that um, that the board need to um, listen at uh, veteran teachers, Miss um, Miss Vukovic gave a solution, and I believe that we should consider what she said. She knows how it works, how it did work, what it resulted for um, for students in their reading and academics and so forth. And I am going to hope that the Board of Education um, says, let's bring back our reading specialist to go in these classrooms and help the students. Thank you. What's the vocal question? Oh, you did have a question. Final question. Question. Uh, three weeks ago, you all approved the uh, Hey Tutor up to $1.6 million, you're going to pay that company $45 an hour for every tutor that they hire, was the way I, I read it. That was three weeks ago. How many tutors have been hired and trained since then? L looking at this data, which is not very good, and looking at the fact that come December, January, they're going to be tested again. Mr. Vukovich, none of them have been hired yet. We have to, we, they have to go through an approval process. I, I think you know the, how the contract, how that works, that, that initially works. So I do want to say one thing since we're on this topic, if mm -hmm. I could. There is a shortage. We've done our best. We, we took a lot of time to determine what was the best approach. Using the research, the research said, and, and it's not just Waukegan, you mentioned use it, using, talking to other districts. We, we, we meet with other districts locally, regionally, and across the country. And the research that was shared w was about how tutoring was the most effective method. Varsity tutors didn't work. It, was, it worked in other districts. We tried it here. It, our, our principals didn't appreciate it. And so we looked for another solution. I, I, I think that that has to be mentioned. I, I'd be remiss if I didn't that the tutoring is, is one component. It's not the sole component of what we're doing. And there are many things that we're doing. Um, so I, I just think it's important to mention that. We haven't onboarded them yet. I want to be fully transparent, but we also, we also have to understand that there's, there's a, there is things that have to happen in between when, the, when the, it's board approved and we move into another. But, but normally when you hire a third party, they, they proclaim to be professionals, can, can move much quicker, which is why an employer such as Waukegan would go to an outside person because they can move quicker. So apparently they're not moving quicker. So. Okay, and that one other thing to bring up, Mr. Vukovic, is primarily in the plan that we presented last year with the tutors, we wanted to hire our own teachers. The bulk of the money that we were expending, or, or that we had budgeted rather, was to hire our own teachers to do the work. The, 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 our, our own teachers were not taking right. those, those positions. All right, they weren't. And it's not a knock on them. It's, uh, they, they're tired. They had a lot going on. Um, but that was, we'd rather have our own teachers. We'd rather, A, we'd rather give the, the money to our own teachers. B, we'd rather have our, our own teachers working with their own students because they're trained and they know them, right? We had to look for other options. There isn't just one silver uh, you know, lining or, or one thing that's going to solve this. It's a multitude of, of, of um, it's, it's, it's a multi-tiered approach. We have to use multiple resources. I, I, and we have reached out to retired folks and lots of people to come in to assist us. People are spread very thin for a number of reasons. It's not an excuse. I, I'm merely stating that we're exhausting every avenue possible. And in terms of soliciting input from our, our teachers, I want to listen to what they have to say. But, but when you reach out to teachers and, and the, uh, yeah. when you reach out to teachers, retired teachers, and the compensation is going to be $35 an hour, but you're hiring people that have no credentials at all, and you're going to pay that for $45 an hour, there's a huge disconnect. 
Yeah. I'll take that. I'll take that in and, and see what we can do to boost that up. I, you're you're absolutely right. So we'll we'll take that into consideration and see what we can do. I don't remember the exact numbers. I'd have to consult with Amanda with what we put into that plan. But that's something we can reconsider to to look at if if it makes makes us more desirable. Excellent point. Thank you, Mr. Vukovic. All right, with that, motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion, second. Motion by Ms. Wozniak, second by Ms. Gonzalez. It's 926. Let's do a restroom break. Let's start at 930, and we will be done by 10 p.m. <laughs> this morning, I woke up to a news about how ACT scores are in 30 million dollars.
Uh, you good? All right. Okay. Ahead. Motion to, I mean, um, I'd like to call the order the October 18, 2022 Operational Services Committee. If I can have a roll call, please. Ms. Hannah? Yes. Here. Mr. Riddle. Present. Ms. Callahan Here. Ms. Present. Ms. Here. Thank you. With that, we have item 4A, which is discussion of the historic uh, landmark. Mr. Riddle, or Ms. Wozniak, if you can set a timer. Mm -hmm. How long? Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes, he said. Five minutes. All right. Let me know when you're ready. I'll take a few extra seconds uh, while she's doing that, Mr. Ewing. Go ahead and get started. Um, so good evening, board members, staff, and community who are still with us this evening. The first agenda item is the historic uh, designation landmark resolution. What we've attached to the agenda item for you, and if you could expand that a little bit on the screen, Mr. White. We're proposing, We first off, we asked the board to take action on a proposal to redo the wall out in front of Lincoln Center at our last board meeting. Um, there were some concerns there seemed to be some confusion so we want to correct that with the resolution so what we've drafted for you is a resolution um, identifying the board's position as a property owner on the landmark application i would like to if you could go to the second page please i would like to go to the middle of the second page um, and i'm going to go ahead and read this because i don't know if everybody has had a chance to see it yet um, now, therefore, the Board of Education, Joaquin Community Unit School District 60, resolves as follows. As a Board of Education, we recognize the significance that the Lincoln Center Wall holds for some individuals in the community considering its age. Respect the authority of the Waukegan Historic Preservation Commission as well as the Waukegan City Council in regard to reviewing and voting upon historic landmark applications and believe decisions about the future of building schools and properties owned by Waukegan Community School District 60 should lie with the school district. Item number two, there are future implications that must be considered if a portion of our property is landmarked. That portion is just the wall itself and not the building. Those include redirection of present and future funds from educational initiatives and or capital improvement, capital projects that benefit students and staff, restriction on district autonomy and determining the full use of district property, increase in time and costs associated with any future use of the property by the district when it involves the wall, and lastly, probable uh, decrease in property value arising out of its landmark, landmark status and the accompanying restriction on property use by current and future owners as the district may not be the uh, forever owner of this property. Item number three, we do not as a board support the landmark application. And item four, this resolution does not address the district's intended future plans for the wall. So again, this is a, uh, a resolution that the administration is bringing forward regarding the landmark application. We wanted to clear this up based on the board action that was requested last week regarding the intended future um, use and future design of the wall. Okay, I need to ask a question. Yes, ma'am. First and foremost, you all are usurping the board's um, authority because the board already voted and um, most of us agreed to not do anything with the wall, or to take it down. Well, not to take it down. Right. Not to do anything until right. the city decided right. something. Right, and, and it, it, you, you, you're you putting in this um, resolution that the board, that we do not, as a board, support the landmark application. That is what they would be asking the board to vote yes or no. The landmark is looking for a stance from the district. It appears, based on the way that this is written, as a Board of Education, we recognize the significance of Lincoln Center, respect the authority of the Historic Preservation Commission, believe decisions about the future should be District 60 decisions. That's what it says. And then if they're going to do it, which is item two, then we want it to be focused on the wall. They are not presenting this. It was the wall. Uh, again, that's what the resolution then reaffirms, so it shouldn't be any issue to support it. But it is... Because the board will have to vote on the resolution. They're not saying to but, do it. Okay, but on number three says... Right, that's what the board will be voting yes or no We do not 
as a board support the landmark application? Yes. So the board would be voting yes or no to that when it comes forward at Tuesday. We already did. We did not. We voted to not do anything to the wall. There was a no vote where they voted okay. and proposed that we redo the wall. And that was voted down by the Board of Education. That wasn't a vote to rebuild, to Ms. Gonzalez's point. That wasn't a, a vote, vote to repair, <laughs> uh, although they're going to explore those options. Most said that they wanted the Historical Preservation Commission's <coughs> process to play itself out. So they're looking for direction this? from this. Can you speak to that part, Ms. Al Jack? As a absolutely. Continue, good good evening, everyone. Um, Thank you, Board President. 30 How much? Seconds. 30 seconds. Oh, okay. So, Mr. Ewing summarized it fairly well. Point four is what we kind of got out of the board from the last meeting. It did not seem that the Board of Education wanted to make a decision right now onto the future of that wall, whether we're going to raise it, repair it, um, or any other thing. What we did want to bring forward was a stance that the board has on this landmark application, or considering the implications of a potential landmark. We're going to have a commission, a historical preservation commission meeting next month, potentially a city council meeting within 60 days of that. If we're asked on how the property owner's stance is on the landmark application, we would need to give something forward. And so we wanted to have this resolution to be able to do so. If you read, it's, it's two pages long. Mr. Moton did a very good job of summarizing those last parts, which is really sort of the, what we're looking the board to take action on. That's going to be the, the board's sort of statement on um, next Tuesday, assuming you uh, take a vote. Right. So the Thank Board you. of Education does not support so the we're No, no, that's asked, what we're going to talk about. We're being asked whether we support the application or not. Correct. So let's go down the line. No, I, I, we're not doing that tonight. No. That's at a vote no. on Tuesday. No, let's so oh, let's discuss it a little bit. I got I I don't like landmark statuses. I, I could talk to that because um, I have a son whose house was landmarked, not by him, and he had windows that he wanted to replace, but he couldn't replace them because they had to be replaced exactly like they were, and that was going to make every window a special window, you know, a custom window, and his windows were terrible, so he left them the way they were. And, and so landmark status, an owner of a property, if somebody goes ahead and puts landmark status on your property and you buy that property, you're stuck with the landmark status. So I do not like landmark status, especially when it's done by somebody who's not the property owner and doesn't want to live in that property and make repairs exactly, you know, realize that their landmark status is going to mean that they're going to keep that building looking like it, like it does presently, uh, even if they, you know, make improvements. In fact, to get improvements, they're going to have to get them approved by the Historic Society to see if they like it. So that, to me, sounds like a reasonable alternative for this board. Do, we, do you know if we have any other property, Mr. Moton, that is landmarked in our district that we have to be aware of? No. Not currently aware at this time, Mr. Riddle. Okay. Um, yeah, so to me, that it's an old wall. It's going to need constant repair uh, in, you know, for generations. It's, it's been there for generations, and um, so I don't... I would certainly think it should not be landmark status since we're creating a precedent and, and it would also, it mentions and here's something about future owners of this property or you just mentioned it. Um, if we were to sell this property, they might say, hey, wait a second, I want to modify the building, which I can do, but I got to keep that fence out there. Or if we wanted to put a, extend the fence down, further down around the rest of our property, the landmark society might say, you got to build a fence that looks just like that. You can't build something else. The other part of it is that wall is in such bad shape. I went out there and took pictures of it. I walked around it. It's bowed in places, not where it's been hit, but I mean, it's falling, it's deteriorating. We could spend lots of money over the next years taking money away, as you said in here, from education. Thank you. Thanks. So Board of Education, it'll come forward. Um, you'll be able to vote your conscience, yes or no, and then that process will proceed. Uh, and again, the yes or no vote is not on to tear down and not to tear down. It's the fact that we don't want it to have historical landmark status. But if, what if the historical... It's our opinion. They ask for our opinion. They'd right. still do what they want to do. That's all it is. hundred percent. <laughs> so the board stance is on the wall. So that is what we would be doing because they specifically <coughs> asked. And the administration, to your point, Ms. Hannah, is not authorized to speak on behalf of the board. No, and because there was no clear board consensus, this is why the resolution is being proposed. 
So if if we vote no, then that'll be. I mean, but again, that I, I think to Mr. Riddle's point, it is affairs. We're not saying that we'll tear it down. We're not saying that we won't tear it down. What we're saying is that the ultimate decision should rest with the Board of Education. Anyway. And based on what I understand about local control, that is is my standpoint. It's our property. We decide what happens to it. And if they come and do something different, we respect their authority, which is clearly stated in the statement. So. Um, me, can I, I want to make something clear, very, very clear. I did not do it as a board member. 100% community member, everything I we know. I did it as a community member. Got it. With much, 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 much support. Can I ask a question about that, though? Uh, this, <laughs> it's up to you all. I mean, it, it, to mine is we do recognize and understand that it was as a community member. We also understand that it creates issues, obviously, for the property owner. And so if other individuals thought it was that important, it would have been good for them to take the initiative. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mr. Riddle. Well, my question was, um, does one have to recruit oneself from a vote if – if yeah, it's a conflict of interest. It's a conflict, is it? Yeah, Y'all calling conflict of interest? There's much conflict of interest going on in the school district. Don't y'all get me started. I'm just asking. Don't question. get me started about conflict of interest. Again, I, I, we are <coughs> well past five minutes on this topic. Um, I think that'll be a, a determination that Ms. Hannah will have to suggest as the person who's bringing forward the application if you should be the one to also vote on the decision as to no, as I, approval. I would recuse myself. Again, so that was that the... That ain't no big deal. So that was the statement, Ms. Hannah. So we are all on the same page. All right. Item 5A. All right. So 5A we have as information. We do have, if you all uh, recall... Ms. Montabano, who's our paraprofessional union president, as well as Ms. Cameron Sweeney, who's the field service director for the IFT. They provided some information on a training for our safety staff around trauma back in April of 2022. I would ask, since they have stayed with us this evening, if we don't put them on a timer, but they obviously, <laughs> we um, they won't need it. So um, I can turn the mic over to them so they can give a brief review of the training that's taken place. Good evening. Um, we will not read the slides. So if you just go down to the pictures, please. Um, we included a few pictures from that we took at the event. Um, we had like 65 safety officers attend the three days all in total. Um, there was pictures on the one I saw earlier. <laughs> Okay, we can get them to you. Um, but we had like 65 over the three days. Um, it was fantastic. Um, I learned a lot about myself and about all of them. Um, so it was really great. Um, we appreciate the district and the board. Um, okay, and then just real quick, so the follow-up, I remember, you know, you talked about follow up and what are we going to do so we are going to be collaborating with Mr. Moten and Mr. Wilson Mr. Wilson to do the refresher for the it's down at the bottom Mr. White I'm sorry it's it's down okay. <laughs> I saw what he was doing I apologize to schedule the refresher and then also um, this is a bargaining year for us and through collective bargaining the union has an interest in negotiating over how we're going to roll this out mm -hmm. to every single paraprofessional in the district. Mm -hmm. So that is a priority of our union and our members. Um, and with that, what I will tell mm -hmm. you through our peace circles, um, some suggestions that did come from our members Perfect. is to have an opportunity to sit down with administration and do a peace circle right and to get to know each other and build that trust especially when we're talking about interactions with um, helping students in crisis what did come up a lot is vicarious trauma and what our members and your employees are exposed to on a daily basis to make sure that they're coming in fresh and ready for kids and that they're given a place to decompress and process what happened because some of the interactions they are involved in it are pretty significant yes. and so we will be um, remedying that through the labor management meeting with mr. Moten and we will stay in touch with you guys because we will be back asking for more space for training 
So thank you. Um, and you can see the pictures. We will make sure you get them. No, it's, it's of it's our. A, it's there. It's, oh, it's the there. second one. Open that second one. Training MOU. No, this. down at the bottom. Oh, well, that's okay. Um, I, I trust that you guys will look. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. That they're the ones that the students really trust, mm -hmm. believe in, and they're there like 24 7. I'm a right. witness. And so that really, you talk the talk, but in my humble opinion, they're underappreciated, under. Paid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Oh. Oh, nice. I happen to be a member of your union, whether you know it or not, and Dr. Batiste put it this mm -hmm. way so that in case you decided, somebody decided to get rid of my position, I could fight it. Well, we would I'm never allow that to happen. You would call me and we'd work it out. No, but I, I, I'm just but, telling you yeah. how important safety is. I started out as mm -hmm. what I'm doing now, sorry, and so like wear, without wearing the yellow, and right. it transformed in 2009 with Nick. We can, he can relate to it. So I just want to make that statement that you guys, are, we're, they're awesome, mm -hmm. they're invaluable, and they're the first line of defense. Yeah, and right. they really, really need to be appreciated, even though I'm, they may be, but even more so. Right. They don't feel that way now. And you have a lot of turnover because they're underpaid as opposed to Stevenson and other high schools. We've lost mm -hmm. some. I know it. We've tried to get them back. They come in conditionally, et cetera, et cetera. Right. I'm going to leave the rest of it alone. Thank you. No, no, I, I agree with you. And, and that is really there was two themes that came out of this it was the education component with really breaking down what Senate Bill 100 means and how do you interpret it and we really discussed that school to prison pipeline mm -hmm. and how that one-to-one -one interaction and that's what they're doing they're, they've already they're, they gave us examples they told us stories about those connections they're making in the hallway right and how do we how do we compound on that? How do we teach others to do what you are or already organically doing, right? But what now we need to collectively bargain, if I may be so frank, is that because of a job description, right, they're not always afforded the opportunity to take it to the next step, mm -hmm. right? To have a space where they can do a restorative peace circle mm -hmm. or to be involved with the reintegration meeting when the family's involved, right? Or to have a seat at the table when the behavior intervention plan is created, mm -hmm. right? And we understand that there are limits to who can be involved in all of that. But um, we think there really is, is a space for our safety officers to help repair and heal within the walls of Waukegan. Yeah. And that's what our union's mission is to support. Um, and we will use our appropriate channels to do so. But what I will say to the board is we really do appreciate you because our members felt valued. Good. Being mm -hmm. paid to go to a professional development where they were treated like professionals, right. mm -hmm. where they were given a platform where they could be open without, you know, feeling that they're going to be judged in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Amy and I, we, we did have a little reception afterwards and we're like, we hope people stay and everyone stayed. Wow. Right. Nice. And so that, and they brought their families. And so it meant a lot to us. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're hoping that we can keep this going Where because it's this? not a one and done. It is the mission of this union. And then one more thing, because of the agreement that was drafted by Mr. Moten and Amy as the union president, it did gain traction in the state of Illinois. And so this weekend, Amy and Olga Colon will be going as the union vice president and um, president to St. Louis to sit on a panel with the Chicago Teachers Union and other suburban schools oh, that have awesome. done this training with the Yay. ISD. Oh, wow. um, and she was one, these two right here, secured collective bargaining language over something that benefited employees, students, in creating a trauma-informed school. Mm -hmm. And so that will be showcased this Friday in St. Louis. So I wanted to yeah, yeah, yeah. give her the That's shout out for that. Right. Yeah. So thank you. Nice job. We'll be in touch. We should see I about just, adding them to other conferences yes. throughout yes. the nation as well. <laughs> and I almost wish that we had heard that earlier because a lot of people don't understand that even building that trust is so fundamental to changing the culture inside the schools and getting the students even you know mentally and emotionally ready to be academically ready and 
you are doing that work. We have <coughs> been supportive of the trainings. We have yeah. been, you know, hearing about even even staff inside the schools that want to do those trainings and be more a part of it and push mm -hmm. it. It just takes a lot of time and effort and, and people who are willing to do that work. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate y'all. Um, and I hope it, you rock. I know you will, but on Friday, you, you know, you're going to do great. Great. Have a great evening. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Too. Thank you. <coughs> thank you for sticking around, and we do appreciate that uh, partnership. Yes. All right. If we can get the agenda back up on the screen again, the rest of the items have been entered for um, information, um, and then the rest are reports. Five so B. I'm going. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh. Going down go those. Yeah. So the information is there about the bidding process. Was there specific? questions related to B? Yeah. Yes. Okay, Comment. go for it. Uh, question, sorry. Um, in, in this RFP, um, I didn't see the rubric, the award rubric for this. Um, I'd like to suggest that we don't pick the lowest bidder for um, this RFP as one of the awarding rubrics. Sure. Um, are you referring to item 5B, the child nutrition? Yes. All right, so I'm glad you brought that up. I was going to make a comment regarding that. Um, in case the board was not aware, this is something we're exploring as we're going through this process. Public Act 12-0, I'm sorry, 12-1101 talks about the exempt services that do not require you to go with the lowest bidder. Mm -hmm. So June 29th, 2022, um, Child Nutrition Services was added to that list. That did not exist the last time we went through this process, which is why we kind of have that note at the bottom about possibly seeking some outside consulting services to support this. Um, again, this is something we're aware of. We're seeing how it applies to this process. This did not exist before. Um, and I, I hope that kind of answers that concern. So uh, we do not have any attachments to the agenda item. This is just a schedule as we're going to take the next couple months to finalize the documents and what the district would like. Uh, we can come back before we issue this out, just so that you all are aware of what we're looking at. But that will be incorporated into our review process. I would, I would Mr. Moten, just very briefly, I would be supportive of us um, getting a consulting firm to help with this RFP if, if needed, if that's a part of the ask for the board. Um, because yeah. I think that the, the feedback that we get from students a lot is that they're not satisfied with the food that they're eating, and that's an investment that we can make yeah, and um, just kind of um, summarize here, are cafeteria workers, are they district employees or are they um, contracted? contracted? Or the, is it both? Yeah, well, it's a little bit of both. The overwhelming majority of them are contracted with the food service provider. We do have an SEIU contract that currently has a small amount of employees that transition as they resign or retire to the food service provider but ultimately what we would be looking for through this is for those individuals to be offered employment if we switch providers they you know the new provider would most likely take on the current contract that is with the SEIU directly with the provider and not with the district because that is a majority of their employees so is this the route we're going to do is this a, we're going to go through the uh, potential consulting uh, firm or are you we're not wanting to, to do the bid ourselves. We're wanting the consulting bird firm to do the bid for us. So we will follow up on more information of that. Okay. We're, we're entertaining that idea just based on the various factors. If the board recalls, I mean, I wasn't directly a part of this process, but I've seen some of the documentation. The last time we went through this, Preferred Mills K-12 LEOR was selected. Uh, we were transitioning from Aramark. There was a lot of back and forth throughout that process. We want to make sure that this is as smooth as possible mm. and we don't have to relive that situation. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, so it's the, it, my only thing with um, RPRQ, lowest responsive, nobody's saying that the, the lowest bid wouldn't be also mm -hmm. the best the bid best for option. the district. Mm -hmm. I think what, what we're saying is uh, now that we have that flexibility, we can really encourage um, more thoughtful 
proposals and then um and then it is a rfp versus a rfq mm -hmm. uh which allows us to kind of say these are the things that yeah. we as a board yeah. want to see and then whoever one. provides the most responsive proposal if, if, i think deputy moton if he asked for a uh, consultant again i would support it but if he also said i feel confident in that if i'm making a recommendation is for the best of the kids based on who applied i would support that as well right uh i think what miss luck was almost asking for the flexibility Williams. Uh, yes, Ms. Williams, and, and, and that's my point is I think that our food service provider has been super responsive and I wouldn't want to just count them out whereas they also have cost considerations which is, is you and know. I apologize Miss Williams go ahead I just please. want to state about the lowest bidder five years ago when we did this uh, and we were awarded preferred meals they weren't the lowest bidder mm -hmm. right. but we have so much issues with the previous yeah, vendor we were able to work with isby right. to get awarded right. the bidder that wasn't the lowest mm -hmm. so there's okay. always options there right. that's okay. great okay. and um so can you yeah. do you guys already have a, a menu of um things that you want to put in the rfp or have you guys not uh, identified types of um types of things right so like i'm wondering are you looking for the service provider to provide like at least uh one time a month or two times a month a multicultural food thing right veggies and snacks and uh, after school programming right um in the the hallway pass by type of meals you know because there's you know there's some some kids can and my my son was one of them right where he had he had to have snacks in between um passing period so he was walking and snacking at the same time right so just I don't know what it is that you guys have identified as the type of culture that food can have in our school district and that's why I was wondering if you guys already identified <coughs> and pinpoint those high level um, pieces I would say is that if we want to bring that back to report on Miss uh, Williams and then just kind of what we would be looking for maybe getting feedback from the board as well mm -hmm. so you all thoughts board thoughts and then uh, making sure that we have that meeting uh, by January. The only other thing that I'll say is also, uh, Ms. Hannah and Mr. Riddle, is that may be a conversation that's facilitated through wellness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh -huh. and, and I, I just like that. Um, <laughs> now, Ms. Hannah, you, oh. you, you said it's 10 o'clock. Go ahead, I'm telling oh. you, because yeah, that was, I'm moving on. <laughs> yeah, because I said 10 o'clock. Okay, no, I just want to know, uh, Mr. Moten. How long have you uh, been putting specs together for the nutrition program? So personally, I have not done that process, Ms. Hannah. I've just reviewed specs from previous process. Okay. So you're saying that you do need a... Um, He's saying he wants the option. <laughs> he hasn't decided. I would, I would like the option. <laughs> Ms. Williams was has been a part of the process in the past, but um, we do know that this is a very important RFP process for the district. Yes. So we are not Always taking this been. lightly. Um, and, and again, Mr. Ewing, we will come back, but there are a lot of things that could be included in the RFP as it relates to quality, as it relates to additional, uh, you know, even putting in a nutritionist for the district within this RFP for a service provider those are there's lots of different options out there so we've been looking at examples talking about PD I've, I've looked at this with some recent professional development as well so we will bring that back I would certainly we would certainly like the option to bring in an expert in this area particularly as it relates to the new legislation got it all right just want to say that there's a template that ISB has us go by so we're not just making up stuff we have uh, it's about a 25 page document that we have to follow and so those specs and stuff that you're asking for can be included in that but we're not just putting anything together thank you Absolutely. all right transportation is there and i think um same question go ahead Ms. for transportation in this agreement um we're doing an rfp um, some things that i've seen previously that we haven't included is uh, some things about like technology and technology uptime in regards to the actual bus that meaning wi-fi's or cameras and or cameras right so what i'm looking for is a high uptime um usage or not usage but you know um it, it's called uptime time um of of those types of services available in in the transportation i'd like to see if we can get something added like that for a transportation rfp 
Yeah. So we don't have cameras in all the buses right now? It, if it has it, we don't have the language that talks about oh, we don't have how, the language. Oh, how okay. like the uptime, right? Like it must be must functional be. Right. at so many percentage <coughs> of I got the, you. the time. I got you. Got it, you. It's an uptime language. Okay. All right, we got item D. Uh, and that is only based off of if Illinois Central gets the RFP award, or is this in general, if they don't get the RFP award, then we are going to maintenance, use them for maintenance? I just have a question on that one. All right. For fine. item D, this is for the district buses, yep. the yep. yellow buses. Yep. So this just runs through the current fiscal year. So, so we're currently under contract with them right now. They do have their own repair mechanic service. Yeah. That they use for their own so buses. our district mechanic isn't working on the buses. He has the district vehicles that he is working on. Correct. Correct. Right. The yep. district vehicles, but not the yellow buses. Yep. Or right. the white buses, right? Yellow or white buses he doesn't work on? Yeah. Doesn't and work on the white ones either? Is we'll have them uh, do a light bulb or oil change, but nothing to that extent as far as working on vehicles compared to a bus. Yep. And so um, if we are no longer contracting with the Illinois Central bus uh, system, if, right, I'm not saying either or, um, this contract, they would still do the maintenance for our buses afterwards. Until June, June 30th of 2023. Right. June, this contract. So, so this contract ends in June. So if, mm -hmm. if we do not have another long-term contract with Illinois Central based on the RFP process, then we would need to look at other options. This, again, could be an item that's incorporated into the RFP mm. to, to make sure that we have coverage for maintenance repair for our buses, our mm -hmm. large buses moving forward. Yep, and right. that's where I was trying to get into that train yeah. of thought, if that right. would be something that would potentially be inclusive in the RFP. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. Ms. Was, yeah. Is that one of our buses that's sitting at Whitmore's on uh, Greenwood and yep. Golf? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And it's been sitting there for... A while, and that's exactly why we need this contract. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's, that's what I thought when slow. I saw this come up. That's what I thought. Okay, and, and um, can uh, Mr. Moten, um, are we aware of a company that has the fleet that we need for our students in transportation? Miss Hannah, are you referring to item D or item C? Item. C. C. Oh, we passed that up. Yeah. Sorry about that, but I still want to know. So, <coughs> we, there are other service providers that can service our district. Really? We, yes. Oh, that's involved. Huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't had we haven't been with Illinois Central forever. There's First Student. There's right. Olson. There's other providers. Mm -hmm. I think one I just know too, but okay. All right, E, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the bus maintenance agreement that was there. E, approval of facility rental waiver request for Phoenix FC. Information has been provided. Item F, uh, pre, uh, approval. Soccer uh, teams. Waiver request for Lions FC soccer. Mm -hmm. Information is attached. G, approval facility waiver request for Ammo Athletics. Glad that we got this on the agenda. Thank you to all three of those organizations. Yeah. Um, H F Y twenty three paper order second shipment. Mm -hmm. um, I is the North Elementary classroom furniture purchase. All right. J uh, where the district camera upgrades, and this is specifically for Glenwood. Mm -hmm. um, K the high school principal benefits. Why have we got that back on there? So it's back on. That's up to the superintendent. Because we didn't vote for it. Oh, I, right, but we are in the midst of a of a. Um, we we paid a company to come in and to look and to do this, and now we're still going to put this on the agenda. It was pulled off before because of the very same reason, and we're going to go vote on it again? No, this is an <coughs> opportunity for you, if you have specific questions, to ask those questions. If there are none, we can move on. We're not taking a vote tonight. No, I know that. So it was asked to be brought back. It was pulled with them to come back and explain the rationale. Right, but what, what's the rationale that we're doing this? 
Yeah, so I will speak to that. Um, so what was mentioned at the last meeting, a question was brought forward if this impacts all assistant principals. It does not. This impacts the six assistant principals at the high school campuses. These principals were previous, the positions were previous lead director positions, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade directors, reclassified to assistant principals. Those individuals upon hire were informed that they would maintain the benefit package of the previous directors, which is why it's identified like this on the agenda item. But in, an, in order to clarify or, or correct some concerns from last meeting, this is not a benefit plan that is currently um, with all assistant principals throughout the district. So that's why it was brought back yes, forward. I misspoke. Right. Yeah. I misspoke. I just, yeah, we just wanted to clarify that. Right. And, and, and the uh, names of the individuals that are on the list, they were, um, they're, they're not any of the new hires. They're the new hires, aren't they? Correct. So there's a list provided under executive content. Again, these are the positions that were hired this summer, either effective July 1 or August 1, depending on their personal situation. Um, these people are new to these positions as of this summer. Right, so they haven't been reclassified. The positions were directors is what they're saying. So Deputy Mo, I heard what you said, um, and that'll be what the board needs to consider. And, and I say this knowing many people that are impacted, is the reclassification meaning they were director titles and then they went to assistant principal titles but typically with the reclassification if those benefits is, is i if they're called assistant principals and if we're looking at the you know whatever plan right i wouldn't want to make any changes until we talk and we identify when that report is coming to the board um and and that's kind of where where or another option is, do we just go back and reclassify instead of assistant principals, these as directors, which they were? But I think we changed the roles and the functions. Otherwise, in my, why did we change the title? I don't. I but think I, I think we yeah, can bring this We'll just this one hold back. it. I'll get you more information, um, and I'll find out why academics, I did let them leave. Um, I'll find out why academics changed the titles. Um, and we'll come back with this. This was just for if you had wanted to ask some questions of LeBaron right now, please ask them right now. I did misspeak because I did when I said I believe all assistant principals and I look back at LeBaron and he's looking at me and we were a little confused. It was late at night. So I wanted to clear it up. Um, but do these, and I think the emphasis, not emphasis, but when we hired the, these people, did we tell them they were going to get the benefit is my question. Uh, yes, we did. So we did. However, as I said earlier, the assistant principals in the district, the job classification doesn't currently have this benefit plan. So these individuals are in the system. They're getting the benefit plan associated with the title. However, this provision, they were informed when they were hired that that would be maintained. So again, we just wanted to clarify this evening because it seemed like there was some additional questions and possible confusion when we brought this forward last week. But yes, they were informed at the point of hire. And just for board clarity, out of I believe there's six of them. Is that yes. correct? So is it that four of them are new? Yeah, some of them are new. They so yeah. all six are new to the okay, positions. Okay, I just want to make sure. I didn't know if we had any old ones. I mean, one went from AP to AP. Yeah, all six are new to the positions. Three of them were current district employees that applied for these positions. So the issue comes with what they were told, but also, and I won't, but that's a, a separate concern that I've had is when we put out these offer letters and mm -hmm. we promise things or we say that these are the benefits that come with these jobs is it's important that we we, right. we 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 check and cross check right this isn't the first instant yeah. incident that we've had of extending an offer well this doesn't match well this doesn't go and my understanding is that that's part of the issue that we yeah. were looking to identify yes. in the um what was it job analysis right yeah. is so again it's not that i don't think these people deserve it no. uh it would be are we expanding it to all <coughs> assistant principals and is it a part of the compensation package that they looked at so we need to maybe fit we need to maybe look at
how the job offers are getting out there and they need to come before us well not the offers what, they, what, what they're proving. going to when they're offering someone something um The board should know because it would eradicate this kind of stuff going on. Yes, it would. It always has. The board. The board I, I don't. I'm not involved at the HR level, so that's not my job. That's not my role. That's not my function. Has never been function like the way it is. So uh, again, this if we can come back or see if it'll we be reported and everything. So it's yeah. not. I apologize to those individuals for the delay. I get the impact uh, that it, it makes to them, but I think this is one of those situations um, that I've seen come up more than I'd like to with all right things right. that were either promised or not promised. A, a problem either with all the rest of the principles. Correct. Yeah. And so uh, then we got L Downtown Lakefront overlay application information. Question. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Will the team provide us a completed application um, when it comes time to approve this? So um, it's our understanding that the Board of Education doesn't need to approve this application. This is here for your information. Um, we will need to submit this. Uh, there is a provision that talks about the eighth of each month for the planning and zoning team to review um, the applications. This is a similar process to what we did for the Weissfield Lights. So again, um, we will double check that. I don't believe it needs board approval, but we are informing you that we are we do need to move forward with this based on the downtown length front overlay requirements because it is a downtown property and it is over 10,000 square feet. And do we know um, this is also a TIF district? Mm -hmm. Right. What does that it mean for us as the, a school? I don't think the property falls in the TIF. Yeah, I thought it did, wasn't it? I, I think thought it's further down. I could be wrong, but I think it's further down. I think it's beyond Water Street. Mm. Yeah. yeah, we don't believe that particular property is, but we can confirm that. Because I think that was like a, a main concern, especially when the school district had purchased it, that it was noted that it was in the TIF district. Um, but I just kind of wanted to also understand uh, what does what does that mean for the school district? Um, is there monetary um, assistance in there, or is there just just trying to just fully understand what what that would mean for us? If you can, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Ms. Ann. Um, I just want to know you all have um, denoted two fourteen Washington Street. I am, um, and I don't know, maybe the other board members know, I don't know, uh, where we have not identified uh, funding for 214 Washington Street. We have. Aside, excuse me. I really am not speaking to you. I'm talking about we do have the funding for the wraparound center through a grant. However, the new educational services center, is that in addition to the wraparound center? So it is, if I could answer the question. So previously we provided a report to the Board of Education and um, the community regarding the intended function of the property. Now because of that function, administrative office space, support functions, transportation, um, the welcome center, registration, those types of functions, as well as the wraparound center. Because it is in the downtown district and it's over 10,000 square feet, we are required to do this. Now we wanted to bring this to your attention so we're not submitting an application without the board being aware. Regardless of when the property is occupied, um, the functionality is, has been presented in the intent. It's, it's well known. Um, in the school district as well as the city of Waukegan what the intended function is going to be But again, we want to fulfill this requirement as the city brought this to our attention because of the size of the property and where it's located Okay, I, I understand all that But now I'm still asking the question Has have we identified the funding source to do anything 
at 214 Washington Street, aside from the wraparound center. Ha has that money been identified? You're saying yes? Yeah, the district is going to be, is currently doing an analysis with our architects as the board approved for $1.5 million to bring back a recommendation for how to proceed with final designs. So with that would be a funding recommendation based on the updated cost estimate, if there are any, based on the final design for the purpose, the intended purpose for the property that we would like to use it for. And, and as we present it in the spring. And you kind of secretive about this? And the Board of Education is supposed to know before you know. And so my point is, we need to know where the money is coming from. The board will approve any final design or bids, mm -hmm. Ms. Hannah. They're not putting forward a final design or bid at this point. Yeah, right. I understand. But, you know, we, we need to kind of go do things in the order it's supposed to be done. And the board should be apprised of all of this before a vote comes to us. And I will. So will it be brought up in an operations meeting? They're not doing. I, that's my point. So they haven't said that they're not going to do that, and it hasn't happened. They presented yeah. the transition to student support plan, which was back in April or May. Is that correct, Deputy Moten? Okay, but, yes. but no one has ever said anything about any money. They they gave estimated cost. The board voted to hire an architect to come back with final cost before it's approved. Am I misspeaking? No, we would follow the process we've always done. For a major capital improvement, we'll come back forward with a bid documentation, a schedule, architect designs before we issue it out to bid. And then when we get the bids, we'll, we'll reevaluate and, and bring that forward for board approval. However, this process, the intended use of the property, yeah, I get that. because it's not... Okay. Well, that, I, again, we just we just want to inform the board LeBaron, about this because this is Can we just look into this and come back? Because it's really late, and I know I don't want to misspeak on anything, and so I hear um, Ms. Hannah's question. So let's just gather our information, and then we'll come back, and we'll give the information to the board if the board will allow us to sure. do that. When designs are finalized and we have a final, we'll, right. we'll come back. Can I ask you a question, though, just to clarify yes, what this was? This is just an application to be brought before the planning and zoning department for the city of Waukegan to just determine what we wanted to do with the property, right? Isn't, isn't that sort of what it is? It's just sure. a plan. So they can understand the intended use of the property. Right, that's all they, it is. They want to know what is not what, telling what how is much gonna, we're going to spend to mm -hmm. improve it or anything. It's just what we want to yeah, use. Yeah, they want to know how the building's going to be used in the downtown area. That's but right. it doesn't rezone it, right? Because I believe it's already zoned for what it is that we're looking to do. Well, it's going in front of planning and zoning, and they will approve yeah. that it's going to be used as a school. Zoning. Oh no, center. school's different, uh, like because that's a whole different ball game, right? Um, I know the word education, educational service center there, is is like that, but it's not really like there's really like no schooling that's happening. It's no. it's really like the administrative piece of it, uh, like a welcome center, right, and those kinds of things. So that's where I think some of some of the confusion might be as well um maybe because of the the naming of it it all it almost alludes to a type of school building which is a whole different process than, than this and i i, I want to make sure we're definitely di differentiating between no. those two absolutely that is the title of the building but the city is well aware that this will not be a school right okay and and um, but it's it is already zoned the way that it, it's intended to use anyways, right? It's I believe commercial or something. Like That's that. correct. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we'll bring out that. Yeah. Yeah. And it may be part of the TIF asked. district. Oh, it is. It uh, the yeah. map map shows it is part of the TIF yeah. district. I thought it was created in January 2014. Mm. Yeah, it was uh, one of the latest wasn't ones. Wasn't that one that was mature? Uh, well, I, I think that one's a ten-year, no, fifteen-year one. Twenty years. Yeah. Miss Pope is going to. Oh, go, go ahead, ahead Miss Pope. Yes, for the Tiff District, uh, we've gotten over the last couple of years that I've been here, approximately a hundred thousand dollars when they've disbanded a, a Tiff area. So we've not gotten a lot of money with that. I wasn't sure whether this particular property was a, a Tiff District. 
um, but more than likely if it is and then we dissolve it we may not get a lot of money from that just so you put that in perspective yep thank you for that mm -hmm. all right it is 1022 there are reports here that were listed for your information the only one i want to call attention to yeoman is the creek. yeoman creek solar site uh, i know yeah. miss uh wozniak you had a question i think we asked for that mm -hmm. yeah it's still on delay yes <laughs> so that's all we did that you good with that well not I good with it but i understand it i i see it i uh, looks like whatever it's, uh, moving forward anyway at least it looks like it's it's not moving forward. Well, it's, it's they're paying slowly. us actually thirty six hundred and they're paying us. That's they're paying us, right? So that's minimal. Good. And um, thirty six hundred dollars a month. So that's good uh, for the next twenty five years. Wait, Mr. President. Yeah, if you want to email those to Deputy Molden, or Superintendent, they can respond and they can do it in public too. Mm -hmm. When are they going to go off? I just wanted to know about oh. the uh, ten year. Uh, uh, life safety, um, the violation cost, and I know that you had said that everything that needed to be done, um, number one, we had put it in priorities, uh, priority A, B, and I think C, I think, and have you reconfigured that? So that is item G under reports. Um, right. We did make some highlights there. It is a it is a pretty large document, 153 pages. Mm -hmm. um, we no, did and what, all, all yeah. the thing, no, 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 don't don't get confused. Okay. All I'm asking is um, of everything that we have done mm -hmm. up to this point, right, of the 10 year study, how much money? Have um, ha have we uh, spit? Because I know that you had talked about that um, that uh, the violations cost was going to be upwards of a hundred million dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe I don't know. I might be saying <laughs> we'll reach out, Miss Hand. I know it's getting late, so yeah. I, I think yeah, you we'll, know, we'll bring anyway, that information back. I'm sure he knows what I'm talking. about. I do. We'll bring yes. that back. And how how much have we spent up to this point on the life on correcting the life safety issues? That was the question. Thank you. It's uh, ten twenty five. With that, I'd like a motion to adjourn. So moved. moved. Motion second. by Mr. Riddle, second by Ms. Wozniak. All in favor, signify by aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody.